Good after, afternoon. Will sergeants please start their recordings? PC recording underway. Thank you. Cloud recording good. Thank you. Backup is rolling. Thank you. And good morning and welcome to, uh, good afternoon and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing on the Committee on Small Business. At this time, would all council members and council staff please turn on their video. To minimize disruption, please place electronic devices on vibrate or silent mode. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.myc.gov. Once again, that is testimony at council.myc.gov. Thank you, Chair Jonai. We are ready to begin. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Council Member Mark Jonai, Chair of the Committee on Small Business, and I'd like to welcome you to our virtual hearing today on two bills. Intros 2233 and 2234 that will dramatically improve the relationship between small business owners and our city government. For too long, small businesses and our city agencies have had an antagonistic relationship. Small businesses view our local government as a hindrance to their success and the enemy. According to a 2016 report by the city controller, there are 6,000 rules and regulations, 250 business-related licenses and permits, and 15 separate agencies that govern small businesses. As the report notes, the alphabet soup of agencies and regulations can lead, can lead even the most knowledgeable and sophisticated business owner frustrated. The controller report found that nearly half of all business owners surveyed did not feel like they had been treated fairly by city inspectors, and more than 55% said agency inspectors had failed to adequately communicate expectations and requirements. Because of the pandemic, and through no fault of their own, small businesses have tragically been closing in mass. According to a recent report by the Hospitality Alliance, for example, over 90% of surveyed restaurants, bars, and nightlife establishments were unable to pay their December rent. Small businesses are experiencing drastic declines in revenue and must decide whether they can reopen or remain open and continue employing their staff during these challenging times. It is an absolute shame that during this period, any business would receive a fine from a city agency for breaking an insignificant regulation. We must ensure that during the remainder of this pandemic, our city agencies forge a strong relationship with our small businesses. City agencies should work with businesses to correct potential violations instead of issuing burdensome fines that small businesses can't afford. As our city, Finally, we begin the conversation of reopening and rebuilding after the pandemic. We must ensure that the administration will not balance the budget on the backs of our small businesses. This is why I'm proud of my bill, Introduction 2234, requiring the waiver and refund of certain civil penalties and allowing additional civil penalty relief during the COVID-19 pandemic. This bill would provide temporarily civil penalty relief for small businesses from certain sanitation, health, transportation, consumer affairs, noise control, and building violations. From the effective date of the legislation establishing long-term civil penalty relief until the expiration of New York City's executive order number 98 of 2020. It would allow for additional cure periods or no penalties for second or third violations. I point out that this bill only takes into consideration one third of the agencies that regulate small businesses. I'm also proud to be a prime sponsor on intro 2233, which permanently transforms the way that the city enforces 
many small business related regulations. The bill would set fixed penalties at the bottom of existing penalty ranges, lower existing penalty ceilings, and lower existing fixed penalties on certain regulations. It would also allow a cure period for many first violations or would eliminate the civil penalties and require a warning of first violations. As the chair of this committee, it has been my priority to make New York City a friendly environment for a small business to start, succeed, grow, and expand. The hearing we're having today is one of the most important hearings we have had during my time as chair. As we advance these bills through this committee, know that we will be transforming the regulatory environment for small businesses and keep more money in their pockets of our hardworking business owners, allowing them to reinvest and redevelop their business models to adapt to these challenging and overwhelming times. We can't wait on federal dollars or state action to save our small businesses. And I hope the administration will not focus on that aid as a default answer as they have been doing so all along. I remind the administration that the fine, that the, I remind the administration that the fine Penalizing and gotcha culture existed prior to COVID-19 and continued during the crisis. The Small Business First initiative that this administration promised would cut bureaucracy and remove outdated regulations and remove business killing fines and penalties took three years, 37 million taxpayer dollars, failed and underdelivered. I look forward to hearing the administration's testimony today and to working together on these bills. The purpose of today's hearing is to hear from the stakeholders about these bills and what we can do to remove unnecessary government burdens and create a more business friendly environment that allows our small businesses to survive this crisis as they try to rebuild so they can thrive in the future. While there will be unscrupulous actors, let me be clear, they in no way will be given a free pass to harm consumers, such as those who attempted to price gouge vulnerable New Yorkers during the height of the pandemic. We will not give aid and comfort to those who turn their backs on our city in its most desperate time of need. So I ask the administration not to use fear and exaggerated scenarios to prevent these much needed reforms. The intent is clear. The 6,000 rules and regulations, 250 business related license and permits and 15 separate agencies that govern small business make New York City an anti-small business environment. Our small business owners want to comply with the laws. They just want to know the laws and preferably in a format that is easy to read and understand and in their own native languages. Not all infractions are an immediate threat to the health and well-being of New Yorkers requiring heavy fines and penalties. A notice of non-compliance with cure period would have the same result. With that said, I'd like to thank my chief of staff, Reggie Johnson, legislative aide, Austin Sacker, our legislative counsel, Stephanie Jones, our policy analyst, Noah Meixler, and financial analyst, Aliyah Ali, for their work in preparing for this hearing. I will also take this time to extend a special thank you to Indiana Porter, Yanita, Yanita John Tangai Gloucester, Mark Chen, and Christopher Gerald for their hard work and the months that they spent on these bills. I want to now take 
the time to turn it over to my dear friend and colleague, Council Member Vanessa Gibson, for an additional statement on her bill. Thank you so much, Chair Mark Jonai. Good afternoon, everyone. It's good to have everyone here at today's very important meeting of the Committee on Small Business. I am Council Member Vanessa Gibson, and I am proud to join with our Chair of Small Business, Chair Mark Jonai, in sponsoring Intro 2233, which would overhaul the administrative code to provide relief to so many of our small businesses across the city of New York. First and foremost, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank all of our small businesses, our merchants, our business improvement districts, and all of our chambers of commerce for all of the work you've done during this global pandemic known as COVID-19. The fact that you have tried to maintain your business to provide a critical service under some challenging circumstances between state regulations, city regulations, capacity issues, guidelines, and so many things that you have been confronted with. We want to recognize all of you, our frontline essential workers, many of you of whom operated during this pandemic. We know that it has not been easy. We've heard from so many of you over the past year, and we truly appreciate your commitment, remaining firm in all the great work you're doing and trying your very best to survive and take care of you and your families. Our neighborhoods feel like home because of our mom and pop shops, our restaurants, our beauty shops, uh, our bodegas, grocery stores. So many of our critical partners are the fabric of our communities. All of you employ 26% of New Yorkers, hundreds of thousands of jobs. You help to generate billions of dollars in sales revenue, property tax revenue, sales tax and income tax alone. Our economy would fail without all of you, our small businesses. And so you are key to this recovery from COVID-19. Our top priority should always be supporting our small businesses, working to educate all of you and not punishing you. We literally have thousands of laws and regulations today that apply to small businesses. I bet you that not a single city employee can name all of them. Many of us can't name all of them. But for some reason, we expect small business owners to know about all of them. That's not fair. It's hard enough to run a business in the city of New York without the worry of surprise inspections and enforcements that could literally wipe out your profits for that day. This past year has been devastating for all of our businesses, for all New Yorkers. And I truly, truly know the city can do more. The federal government can do more. The state government can do more. But at a local level, we need to do everything we can within our constraints to fix this problem. It wasn't easy to get here. Our staff at the legislative division spent months poring over laws to identify violations and punishments that simply didn't make sense hundreds of hours drafting language just to fix it. So if you don't have the correct sign hanging up in your store, you should get a chance to fix it, right? It shouldn't cost you $375 because you had to make a delivery in a van that didn't have your name and address on it. That's not fair, that's punitive. Before the pandemic hit, the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene alone issued $26 million and $30 million a year in fines. Consumer affairs, over $10 million. That's from tens of thousands of violations. We cannot return to that. We need to do everything we can to give small businesses a real shot, a real shot, a tangible shot at recovery. And even though this bill amends more than 180 different laws, we know that our work is not done. This is a starting point. This is a foundation. This is a stepping stone. This is a beginning point for us to look at all of these existing regulations and somehow find common ground and common balance. I'm excited to hear from our small businesses today, our business advocates, so many activists, our chambers of commerce, our bids and merchants associations, all of you representing small businesses right here in the city of New York. Certainly about today's agenda, but also about what we can do to help all of you as you survive this pandemic. Finally, I thank again, our chair of small business, Chair Mark Joni. I wanna thank the speaker, Speaker Corey Johnson and Jason Goldman and the entire team at the speaker's office for all of their work. Certainly, I wanna thank the staff that's been recognized, India Porter, Mark Chen, Tangia Wright, Jonathan Masserino, uh, Zamina Fernandez, Cordero Perez, 
and also want to thank Janita John. Thank you, everyone. I certainly also want to recognize my committee staff of the Committee on Oversight and, and Investigations. Thank you to Ed Atkin and the team, and I look forward to today's hearing. Thank you again, everyone. Thank you for all of your work. Thank you, small businesses. We are here for you every step of the way, and I look forward to today's agenda. Thank you, Chair Jonah. I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Councilmember Gibson. Before I turn it over to our moderator, Committee Council Stephanie Jones, to go over some procedural items, I'd like to acknowledge that we've been joined by Council Members Holden and Rosendahl. Now I pass it to Stephanie Jones, our Committee Council. Thank you, Chair Jonai. I'm Stephanie Jones, Council to the Committee on Small Business, and I will be moderating this hearing. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify, at which point you will be unmuted by the host. During the hearing, I will be calling on panelists to testify. Please listen for your name to be called as I will periodically be announcing who the next panelist will be. At this hearing, we will first be inviting testimony from the Department of Small Business Services, followed by testimony from the Department of Consumer and Worker Protection and then from members of the public. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question of the administration or a specific panelist, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in order. For all panelists, when called on to testify, please state your name and the organization you represent, if any. We will now call representatives of the administration to testify. We will be hearing testimony from Janelle Doris, Commissioner of the Department of Small Business Services, and from Lorelei Salas, Commissioner of the Department of Consumer and Worker Protection. We will also be joined for questions by Amna Malik, Assistant Commissioner of Business Operations and Regulatory Reform at SBS, Mike Tiger, Deputy General Counsel at DCWP, and Stephen Atanani, Executive Director of External Affairs at DCWP. At this time, I will administer the affirmation. Panelists, please raise your right hands. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Commissioner Doris? I do. Thank you. Commissioner Salas? I do. Thank you. Assistant Commissioner Malik? I do. Thank you. Deputy General Counsel Tiger? I do. Thanks. Executive Director Etanani? I do. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to invite Commissioner Doris to present his testimony. Good afternoon, uh, Chair Jonai and members of the Committee on Small Business. John L. Doris, the Commissioner of the New York City Department of Small Business Services, or SBS. I'm joined by Lorelei Salas, our Commissioner of the Department of Consumer and Worker Protection, DCWP and from my senior leadership team, Assistant Commissioner of Business Operations and Regulatory Reform, Amna Malik. At SBS, we aim to unlock economic potential and create economic security for all New Yorkers by connecting them to quality jobs, building stronger businesses, and fostering thriving neighborhoods across five boroughs. I'm pleased to testify on the work SBS and partner agencies are doing to reduce the regulatory burden on small businesses. At the beginning of the administration, Mayor de Blasio tasked SBS, the Mayor's Office of Operation and Regulatory Agencies to find ways to ease the city's regulatory environment for small businesses. The city launched Small Business First, a multi-agency initiative with four key goals, provide clear information and coordinated services and support, help business owners understand and comply with regulations, reduce the burden imposed by complex regula regulations and penalties, and ensure equal access for all business owners. Using these principles, Small Business First worked with more than 600 business owners, CBOs, Chambers of Commerce, local economic development corporations, bids, industry professionals, elected officials, and over 15 city agencies to identify 30 recommendations to target and implement. SB1 streamlined the permitting processes and created an online business portal where businesses can complete applications, make payments, and get status updates. To date, there have been more than 7.2 million visitors to the portal with over 45,000 accounts created. We also pro produce 29 
plain language guides and launched our compliance advisors program. Additionally, punitive practices needed to be rooted out and prioritized for change through the lens of equity. Although the city was successful in implementing all the recommendations uh, from SB1, altogether, uh, the city was successful in implementing all the recommendations from SB1. These changes save businesses more than 50 million annually by reducing fees for licenses and permits, reducing processing times for application, reducing penalties, and educating businesses on how to avoid penalties. In total, SB1 reduced small business penalties by over 40%. Building on the success of SB1, the mayor committed to expanding civil penalty relief further for small businesses, including eliminating penalties for first time vi uh, violations and expanding curable offenses. Ensuring that public health, safety, and quality of life were maintained, SBS worked with our partner agencies and identified 73 additional violations for cure uh, or first penalty elimination, which will greatly improve the business environment in the city. Expanding curable violations and eliminating first time offense penalties allow enforcement agencies to prioritize education and compliance over financial penalties. To date, small business services have helped save businesses 118 million in penalties through education. Our compliance advisors and business advocates have completed over 8,000 consultations, working with business owners on a recurring basis to help them navigate and succeed in the complex regulatory environment. We provide targeted guidance through our online on-site uh, consultations to help business owners become aware of and learn how to avoid common violations across city agencies. The advisor are, advisors are able to conduct consultations on site and in a business uh, owner's preferred language. They cut through bureaucracy and red tape to bring equity and consistency to businesses. You can be assured that we are taking it all, taking in all of this field information and using it to inform our work going forward now in the future. In the midst of this work, we were thrown into the depths of the pandemic. SBS and city agencies had to adapt quickly and collaborate to design programs and services to support small businesses during the health and economic crisis. Brand new programs like open restaurants and open streets were created to reduce the public health risk and create opportunities for businesses. And although SBS is not a reg regular regulating agency, we work with many of our partner agencies to, to who made concerted efforts to prioritize outreach and education over penalties and enforcement for businesses struggling during the pandemic. The number of civil summonses issued by the city's enforcement agencies fell significantly in 2020. For example, compared to 2019, DOT issued 42% fewer summonses this past year, NYPD issued 56% fewer, and DOHMH issued 75% fewer. Despite the challenges of the pandemic, the city has successfully implemented changes to nearly 60% of the targeted 73 violations, and we expect to complete the remaining changes this year. We estimate this will reduce penalties by an additional 10%, creating a total reduction in penalties of 50% by the end of this year. During the pandemic, we have seen the stark inequities our society holds in its framework laid bare. At SBS, we have witnessed this challenge in the city's neighborhoods because of the businesses uh, who are impacted every day. From the 55,000 calls to our hotline, to the 74 business corridor tours visiting thousands of businesses across all five boroughs, to deep collaboration with our bids, chambers of commerce's restaurant organizations and business groups, we recognize the problem and move to address them. This work will not end with the pandemic. As you know, as laws are created, they need to be continually reviewed, modified and eliminated to ensure the remain, the re, and remain relevant and uphold their intent. We have an obligation in government to continually search for laws and violations that lead to deeper inequity and move to correct them. This past year, we launched over two dozen programs and initiatives, fielded over 55,000 phone calls, hosted over 350 webinars with nearly 50,000 attendees. We have done 74 walks reaching thousands of small businesses. Our focus has been on supporting the needs of our small businesses and the hardest hit communities, including minority and immigrant owned businesses. Before closing, 
I would like to turn to the two bills being heard today, sponsored by Chair Joni and Council Member Gibson, who shared the council's goal to help small businesses by cutting penalties and allowing individuals to cure violations. We are still reviewing the extent of the proposals and look forward to working with the council in coming up with a balanced approach that achieves our mutual goals, while still giving our agencies the tools needed to deter those who seek to take advantage of New Yorkers. Commissioner Salas will go into more detail on the implications of the legislation on the city's consumer protection law. I end my testimony with the commitment from SBS to continue working to make the regulatory environment easier for small businesses while protecting the public health, safety, and quality of life of all New Yorkers. We know there is always more work to be done, and we look forward to continue partnership with the council to identify new opportunities to reduce the regulatory burden on small businesses across the city. Thank you, and I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you, Commissioner. At this time, I'd like to invite Commissioner Salas to present her testimony. Good afternoon, Chair Jonai, Council Member Gibson, and members of the Committee on Small Business. I am Laura Lay Salas, Commissioner of the Department of Consumer and Worker Protection, or DCWP. I am joined today by my colleague, Small Business Services Commissioner uh, Doris, and my colleagues, Michael Tiger of our Deputy General Counsel and Stephen Itanani, our Executive Director of External Affairs. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today before the committee. I agree with and echo my colleague, Commissioner Doris and his testimony in support of the intent of both the introductions under consideration. But we oppose the proposal of dissolution, dilution, dilution of DCWP's foundational law, the Consumer Protection Law, also known as CPL. Diluting the CPL and not improving its protections will have tremendously negative consequences for the most vulnerable of our city's constituents and stifle our agency's mission during a time of extreme crisis. In fact, we look forward to working with the council to strengthen the protections of the CPL. There is no question that the administration and DCWP supports small business relief. We have prioritized giving small businesses the tools they need for compliance and work with council to cut red tape for licensees and other businesses. Prior to the pandemic, our agency instituted robust language access and educational collateral to serve our small businesses. We established the visiting inspector program to educate licensees about the laws and rules applicable to their businesses. With one-on-one -on -one personal visits, where we provide businesses with plain language checklists so they know exactly what we will be looking for in the future. We have eliminated redundant license categories, saved businesses up to $9.8 million through 31,000 cure eligible violations issued since 2014 and have proactively approached the council with new cure eligible violations we believe should be implemented. At the onset of the COVID-19 crisis, we partnered with council to refund $12 million in consent fees to restaurants and extended license and renewal periods for more than 50,000 licensees. We also suspended patrol inspections at the start of the state of emergency. And our team has actively been on the ground educating more than 3,500 small businesses door to door on safe reopening guidance. This is all to say that the goals of these bills are broadly in step with our own efforts to support our city's small businesses. However, we can achieve the goals of providing relief to small brick and mortar businesses without abandoning our most vulnerable consumers. Likewise, we do not believe that businesses who egregiously decided to price gouge consumers on goods used to treat, prevent, and limit the spread of COVID-19 should have their civil penalties returned to them. Since 1969, the CPL has been an essential component of our city's government's obligations to protect our constituents from harm, including from the minority of businesses or, or corporations that would seek to deceive our consumers. Significantly, before the council's consideration is introduction 1622, 
which modernizes the CPL to reflect the council's commitment to guard New Yorkers from deceptive online transactions, require documents be translated in a consumer's language of preference, and provide penalties that are effective deterrents of predatory conduct. That bill has the support of council member Ayala, chair of the Consumer Affairs and Business Licensing Committee, along with the majority of members of that committee. In 1969, the cost of bread was consumer, for a consumer was 20 cents. Since that time, the CPL's penalties have remained unchanged. Now they are among the lowest consumer protection penalties in the entire country and are not an adequate deterrent for businesses. Fair penalties that protect New Yorkers from real harm make sense. Much like the civil penalties in councils recently passed legislation to protect our small businesses from unreasonable fees from online delivery apps to require small businesses to disclose their collection of biometric data or to require hotels to report their service disruptions. The CPL enjoys broad support from labor, immigrant, legal services and economic development organizations. These organizations made up of everyday New Yorkers know the impact of the CPL on our lives. They know it is the shield that deters notarios from preying on immigrant New Yorkers who are in search of the American dream. It is the safeguard that allows us to pursue cell phone companies who deceive consumers into buying used phones marketed as new or for-profit schools who deceive students into taking grants that convert to private loans without the student's knowledge. In sum, the CPL gives the agency standing to pursue predatory practices citywide. Take, for example, price gouging. This is work that we pioneered after public outcry from, from more than 12,000 New Yorkers. Businesses that use the darkest hours of the pandemic to exploit their consumers should not be given a reprieve from those acts. We as a city should strengthen the CPL's protections and should be concerned by measures to reduce them or forgive past penalties issued under its authority. The CWP supports the intent and efforts to help our small businesses, but are strongly opposed to weakening the nation's first ever municipal consumer protection law. The CWP at its core is dedicated to protecting our consumers and workers and diluting this law would go against this very mission. Intrinsically tied to this is the work we have done to protect our city from endemic price gouging that arose during the pandemic. We encourage the council to include intro 1622 or its core provisions with this legislative package. An update to the consumer protection law is needed now more than ever. Thank you for the opportunity to testify and I look forward to any questions you may have. Thank you, commissioner. I will now turn it over to questions from Chair Joni. Panelists, please stay unmuted if possible during this question and answer period. Thank you. Chair Joni, you may begin your questions. Thank you so much. My first, uh, I wanna thank both commissioners for participating uh, and testifying today. And I want, in my opening statement, I refer to making sure that we look at the 6,000 rules and regulations that truly are a burden on our small businesses. Not all 6,000 rules and regulations, not all 250 licenses that are, and permits that are required and the 15 agencies that oversee these 6,000 rules and regulations are all life-threatening immediate hazards to the life of New Yorkers. Not all 6,000 rules and regulations are protecting consumer consumers from ill-intended small businesses. I put that into my opening statement to make sure that we didn't get off the path. These two bills in no way are meant to protect small business owners that maliciously have taken advantage of and that harm or potentially risk New Yorkers or take advantage of vulnerable New Yorkers with price gouging. I put that in there and I don't want this hearing to become what we have to protect. We know our responsibilities. We know what our 
jobs require us to do, and that is to protect New York, New Yorkers. I'm looking at the 6,000, of which only a little over 180 rules and regulations are highlighted in these two bills. The importance of this hearing is so that we can hear from stakeholders, including the agencies and small businesses on what more we can do. Commissioner Doris, you pointed out, I believe it was Department of Health, NYPD, and DOT is the three agencies that reduced the number of uh, summonses that were issued. Am I correct on that? You're on mute, Commissioner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, uh, we just listed those three, but we did see a uh, decline in summonses across the city uh, and old summonses across the city um, uh, since last year. Thank you for that, Commissioner. Although there was a reduction in summonses that were issued, DOT in calendar year 2020 where most of our businesses were shut down, New Yorkers were ordered sh shelter in place. They still issued 28,703 violations. Department of Health, dramatic decrease, still issued 16,558 violations. Basney issued 258,977 violations during a period of which most businesses were forced shut down. So I appreciate that you mentioned the reduction in summonses. But as you can clearly see and as evident, by the number of violations that were issued, that the city continued to issue summonses at alarming rates. Um, would you like to respond on that, Commissioner? Uh, yeah, you know, I, I believe that um, you know your your uh, reviewing of the actual numbers. Uh, you know, we believe last year there was significant decrease. And uh, look, we're working towards continuing to decrease. I think, you know, as you issue a, a summons, uh, there's a process, some of these could be cured, et cetera. Now we're still analyzing uh, all those numbers, but certainly we're here uh, in support the intent of this bill. And uh, you know, we've sort of taken tours around as well and, and spoke to businesses about some of these concerns. And I think uh, our, our concerns are aligned uh, when it comes to uh, making sure that we begin to streamline even further uh, some of these uh, uh, as well. We mentioned also in our testimony about the additional uh, 73 or so that we found uh, that we are working on right now, over half of them completed that uh, we are also uh, seeking to have uh, uh, you know, changed and reduced and put into cure periods, et cetera. So, um, we certainly are aligned on, on the intent here. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner, um, would you happen to know which inspections have been put on hold during the, during the pandemic? I'm sorry, me? Oh, yeah. So I, uh, what types of inspections have been put on yeah. hold? I've, yeah. you know, which, pardon? Yes, what types yeah. of inspections, which departments have been put on hold from enforcing and uh, overseeing, whether it be expired uh, licenses and permits, uh, signage uh, regulations. Do you have any idea how many have been on hold calendar year 2020 or specifically during the pandemic? Uh, I know most of the agencies were focused on, on health and safety and 
Uh, and then the mayor, as you know, had uh, declared that we were in an education first uh, posture. Um, and for, uh, for the changes that were made, particularly restaurants and others, uh, types of businesses. So I do know that uh, agencies were reviewing health and safety and certainly focus on focusing on those particular uh, violations. If I may jump in, uh, I can speak from DCWP's perspective, Chair John I. Um, first, I just want to acknowledge um, that the remarks that you made at the opening of the of your test of your introduction of this hearing and reassure where we are sure to hear that uh, you know your concern also about price gouging. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about the question that you just posed. From our uh, data, I can tell you that uh, when we compare 2019 to 2020, we have issued 50% less summonses during the uh, year 2020. And we suspended patrol inspections right at the outset of the pandemic. So the typical inspections where you would see DCWP uh, inspectors going door to door, we suspended those. The majority of our inspections where um, with respect to price gouging in response to those complaints and also uh, in our role working with other agencies during the business reopening work that we did under the Office of Special Enforcement um, umbrella. Thank you, Commissioner Salas. Case in point, year over year, calendar year 2020 over 2019, the city still issued 529,732 summonses, a, a major reduction from the previous year, but that is still almost 530,000 violations that were issued, and they all came with penalties and fines. Um, so I thank you for your response, Commissioner. But the question that I had asked was if we knew what inspections had been put on hold, understanding the priority on health and safety and education for COVID. And the reason I asked for that question is if there were a hold on agencies and departments from enforcing, why did the city feel that these particular inspections could wait? And either commissioner can answer that question. Again, I would just say that the inspections that DCWP conducted were mostly in response to complaints um, regarding price gouging situations. Uh, we had over 12,000 complaints from consumers regarding price gouging, so we actively were looking into that. Um, and the business reopening um, inspections that we did as part of the work with the Office of Special Enforcement. Um, we were not actively patrolling and looking for other types of um, compliance reviews since March. Um, the focus for us was price gouging and business reopening. And I am not aware of uh, the other agency's enforcement strategy going back. Well, thank you, Commissioner Salas. The, of the 12,000 reported uh, incidents of price gouging, how many violations or how many um, small businesses did you find were in violation of our small, of our price gouging laws? Um, yes, yeah, so we received over 12,000 complaints and I am just looking for that information right now. Um, we issued uh, approximately 1,100 summonses in response to those complaints. The 1,100 summonses were um, um, about 300 each in Manhattan, Queens, and Brooklyn, 200 in the Bronx, and 23 in Staten Island. So roughly 10% of the complaints found wrong, ill-intended small businesses. Right. We may have received, uh, you know, several complaints against the same business, right? So, yes. The reason I, I picked up on what you had brought up as an issue, because we keep, out, we keep focusing on price gouging. Again, I want to reiterate, these two bills do not, are not intended on undermining the laws that we have for price gouging, nor are they asking for refunds uh, to 
those small businesses for the fines that they received and paid for price gouging. So I'm hopeful that we can stay away from that conversation altogether. That is not the intent. We want to keep away from that focus. There are 6,000 other rules and regulations out there, uh, and not all of them are immediate threat to the health and safety of New Yorkers or involve price gouging. That's the focus. So, Chair, I just want to, um, and again, I want to reiterate what the Commissioner mentioned. I, I, you know, your remarks were uh, clear, clear as day, and we appreciate that. I think what um, our intent with testimony was to clarify something that a lot of folks don't know is that like our price gouging laws were promulgated under our consumer protection law, which is our foundational law. We completely agree and have in fact forwarded over 40 cure violations to the council that were incorporated in this package. We believe full heartedly and support the small business package um, by and large, but as it speaks to our consumer protection law and it's a fact or as related to our, our uh, price gouging work, that is where our contention is because that law in of itself is outdated as is, hasn't been updated since 1969, and I think was mistakenly implicated um, in the bill. But your intent and introductory remarks were clear and we appreciate that as well. Thank you. We'll continue to work on strengthening the Consumer uh, Protections Act uh, to bring them up to date, uh, but there's more out there that can be done. And quite frankly, we have 15 agencies and it's just not uh, your agency commission that we're focused on. There's a total of 15 agencies that are issuing tickets and violations on a daily basis. That's the point that I'm making. But the reason I asked the question about how many inspections have been put on hold on the pandemic um, and why did the city feel that these particular inspections could wait is it also seems that perhaps those requirements could also be candidates as to what regulations we would be looking at to extend a period or a cure period that don't necessarily require a fine or a penalty. And in this case, it takes two to tango to get this done. If there is a willingness for the city council on this administration to truly sit down and collaborate on where we can agree. And we have a slew of laws that we can focus on and they're not focused on the consumer protections that we want to strengthen. There's a slew of other laws, the 15 or 14 other agencies and departments that we can look at to make sure that we still protect consumers, but give small businesses a fighting chance and always underscoring whatever is not an immediate threat to the health and well-being of New Yorkers. A sign font should, is not an immediate threat. A sign that is put behind the register instead of in front of the register is not an immediate threat. A wall that just to comply with the number of notices that the city mandates every employer should have posted in a conspicuous place, which means you need a wall that's 10 feet wide, 10 feet high, is not an immediate threat. There's plenty of more things that we can focus on. So my question continues, and I'll ask this of Commissioner Salas. Intro 2233 reforms DCWP's notice of violation process. Can you please explain the current process and describe how the changes proposed in the bill will affect enforcement in your agency? Uh, thank you for the question, Chair Donai. Um, we do. We are still looking at the language, um, the proposed legislation, um, and I just want to again uh, reaffirm our commitment to working with you and the rest of the committee on finding ways to remove um, relieve small businesses from burdensome uh, regulations that do not harm consumers or workers. Certainly, we are aligned in that intent. Uh, we do think that um, some of the sections that change our enforcement process. Um, like cure processes, data tracking, and more. Uh, we want to work with you on ensuring that the process that you are attempting to get to, it's not um, 
unduly creating burdensome issues for businesses themselves, right? Um, we have currently a curable um, process for a number of other violations that works well, in our opinion, and expanding just the types of violations that can be included in that, um, I think is something we can work with. Um, and I'm not sure if uh, Mike or Steve want to add anything else to that. Yeah, I think uh, there's probably some, sp uh, on the operational side of things, I know uh, there, there, there are probably some, some tweaks that we would like to be made so that we can effectively enforce and fulfill our mission as, a, as, as an agency to protect consumers. I think something like a protracted back and forth um, um, that would inhibit our ability to patrol businesses um, and, and uh, uh, remove that posture from our agency is something that we wouldn't want as an unintended consequence of this legislation. But as the commissioner mentioned, we're looking at the language actively um, and we'll be happy to work with you and your staff um, as this bill progresses in the legislative process. Thank you, Steve. Commissioner, can you uh, explain the current process of the enforcement of your agency? So there Walk are... us through the day-to-day. -day. Sure. So, um, first of all, I, I just want to say that um, for the last two or three years, um, actually maybe more like four years now, uh, we have had to balance our um, our had uh, licensing businesses, right? And having to provide a service to small businesses and also enforcing our consumer protection and worker protection laws. So we are always trying to find ways to, um, to address the needs that you pointed to of having businesses that are educated on the laws, that they have the tools to comply in their languages. We set up a process, uh, a new program actually called the Visiting Inspector Program. It's, um, it's been in place for the last couple of years. And basically what it does is when you obtain a license for the first time from our agency, what you first see is an inspector who comes to do a purely educational visit to your business. This is an, a visit arranged with a manager or an owner. And we come in and we explain everything you need to comply with. So we take outreach and education seriously. Um, and we have a number of materials in different languages as well our, as our checklists. So when we come in to educate you, we give you a copy of the checklist that our inspectors use when they do the inspections, right? So there is nothing hidden, it's in plain language and you understand exactly what we'll be looking for. Um, in addition to that, we also conduct uh, business education days and we've done it with a number of council members who have asked us to come out to commercial corridors to go door to door, talking to businesses that need information from us. We are required to do 10 business education days in a year. We, last year, we did 33 business education days. We went to some of the neighborhoods that were hardest hit by COVID-19, knowing that the businesses needed a lot of information and education, understanding that there are new state guidelines that were getting published. So we take this very seriously. Additionally, we have uh, adjusted our, st our strategy for enforcement to focus on areas or industries where, is, where there is the greatest harm to consumers if there's no compliance with those laws, right? Um, so that is sort of the, the basis from where we start. Now, we do two things. We respond to complaints and we also do patrol inspections. We're supposed to look proactively for compliance with the laws and rules of our licensees. Like I said, last year, again, we focused mostly on complaints response. Uh, now, there are a number of curable violations in the law uh, that the council worked to, to pass, you know, establishing the law, make sure that the first time we see a business for some signage and receipt violations, right? Like failing to post a sign that says um, what the, um, you know, what is the minimum purchase for, uh, to be able to use a credit card, right? Or the fact that a receipt has to include um, all kinds of information, including the license number. Uh, for some of those first time violations, businesses may receive a curable violation, which means they get a notice that they be, are in violation of this particular provision of the law, but they have a chance to cure it and to send us proof that they actually fixed the problem. And in that case, they will not incur in fines. Um, 
And I just want to check with Mike and Steve to make sure that everything I've said is accurate or if there's anything else that you want to add to that. And what, what is the next step on that? Yeah, I, I mean, yeah, of course, it's what you said is accurate, yeah. Commissioner. Um, I would I would also mention that as we go on patrol inspections that uh, uh, consideration is given, of course, um, to uh, any language barriers that we may encounter in the field as we uh, enter a business. Our inspectors uh, are multilingual in many cases. They and um, certainly, if we have information ahead of time that that in our notations and our in our uh, software and and process that indicate that a particular business owner is fluent in one language or another will assign um, the appropriate inspector with that capacity to go in. We also utilize language line um, to bridge those gaps. And of course, as the commissioner mentioned with our education and compliance work, our plain language checklists uh, are, are uh, and, and collateral uh, writ large are translated into um, all the languages uh, that are designated city languages. Um, and in many cases, we go above and beyond um, that, that statutory requirement to ensure that folks have the information in the language that they uh, most completely understand and are uncomfortable uh, uh, transacting in. Thank you for that answer, Steve and uh, Commissioner Salas. You, you mentioned that you Historically, you have to do 10 days of educational days to a calendar year, and last year did 33. How many sites did you actually visit? How many small businesses did you actually visit during those 33 yeah. days? Yes. Um, mm -hmm. For each business education day, we aim to visit anywhere between 70 to 110, 120 businesses on that day. Um, and I'm just looking right now at, okay, the numbers of businesses we visited in 2020 were about 2,100, uh, 2,100 um, businesses visited door to door. So that means it's my agency coming in. We often invite other um, agencies like sanitation, uh, small business services usually comes along too. This is in addition to the other work that they do, right? Um, and, and we are simply coming to those corridors um, based on like the need that we see, but also partnering with council members who say to us, I want you to come to this particular area. This is where I see a lot of need for more outreach and education. Um, and so, yes, we did 33 business education days beginning in June. So the moment the city started reopening, uh, we put our staff out in the, in the field. I am often, uh, in the field with them. Um, business owners have an opportunity to talk to me directly and give me feedback if they see that they're, you know, they're finding that um, they have issues understanding what we're asking them to do, or they have, you know, some constructive feedback, which often comes along when I visit. Um, so uh, we are trying our best and we'll welcome more ideas for where to do outreach in the city. But I want to just also make a clarification because you asked me about um, our, uh, patrol um, strategy, you know, as, as I mentioned before, the consumer protection law is pretty broad, right? It doesn't just capture the types of violations that you see um, brick and mortar businesses um, sometimes, um, you know, see themselves, right? Like the receipts, the signage. But with this law, we are also uh, protecting consumers from the more deceptive fraudulent practices by some companies, right? Uh, when I I say that an example would be like immigrant New Yorkers who are um, defrauded by immigration service providers or attorneys who are selling them this inexistent visa and charging them, you know, thousands of dollars and putting them in deportation proceedings. That is the type of protection that the immigrants need. We use the CPL to protect them. We use that to protect consumers who go to a used car dealership and end up buying a lemon, right? And with a loan with 24% interest rate, it's signing documents that they didn't understand. So it is pretty broad in its coverage. And all we're, we're saying here today is that there's definitely a balance that we can find together to protect those consumers and also find ways to relieve the brick and mortar businesses that we you know, make, the, the, make our neighborhoods what they are. And I'll say that, you know, 
I think, um, you know, the 2,500 businesses that we've uh, visited by way of 33 business education days this past year, that's our most intimate level of outreach in a lot of ways. It's our most resource intensive uh, um, level of outreach that we, that we conduct. Um, and that work is informed, particularly this past year, um, by zip codes that fall within and have informed uh, the racial inclusion and equity task force that the mayor uh, put together and that the commissioner serves on. So we're going and, and using our limited resources in the most strategic way possible to visit businesses um, in those communities and corridors that really can't, from a business, business perspective, can't afford to, to be nickel and dimed by, by city agencies, but also whose consumers can't afford to be nickel, nickel and dived by any predatory businesses. So that's where we're putting our resources first and foremost. Of course, as uh, I'm sure Mike, my colleague can attest to, um, the general counsel division puts on intensive uh, uh, presentations for license categories that we call DCA 101, future iterations, I'm sure will be called DCWP 101. Um, ones that come to mind speak to like the laundry license category. Again, these are uh, uh, borough wide presentations that, that are put on to give a legal presentation to owners so that they know the laws and rules that they are being asked to comply uh, to and for, um, oftentimes after the council acts to, to step up regulations. And we have, of course, materials online on our website and uh, broader virtual based presentations that we do with community partners um, that have uh, a scope and, and breadth of thousands of businesses citywide. Um, so I, I don't want to give the impression that our only outreach is to a very small segment of the population. It's really, we highlight the business education days because it's our most intensive outreach and we're going basically where folks need us the most um, in the city. And just to add what Steve said, um, you know, to give the example that uh, Steve gave of uh, DCA going to be DCWP 101s. I mean, we gave one in the last couple years on consumer protection law, but we also gave two uh, very well attended DCA 101s, the home improvement contractor licensee community uh, in multiple boroughs. And we got a very positive feedback on that. But thank you all for that. I have two more questions and I want to then pass it over to uh, Council Member Gibson, who I'm sure has her own questions, and my other colleagues. Uh, before I do that, I just want to acknowledge that we've been joined by Council Member uh, Levin and Perkins. Uh, Commissioner Salas, I have a question for you, and then I'm sure Commissioner Doris will correct me if I'm wrong. Then. I believe the accepted number of small businesses that New York City acknowledges is 240,000 in the city of New York. Am I correct, Commissioner Doris? That's correct. You have visited, I heard the number to 2,100 and 2,500. That represents 1% of the total small businesses in New York City. While it's uh, commendable that you're doing the outreach, and that's on a year where you did 33 educational days versus the typical 10 days. We certainly can do a lot more and reaching out to these small businesses is in the best interest of New Yorkers, our city, and those small businesses so that we can educate them. Uh, commendable on the outreach attempt, it certainly doesn't go far enough. And we should be struck, we shouldn't be taking credit for the 2,500 businesses that we reach. There are 240,000 businesses out there and there were 500,000 violations issued. But my question to you, um, Commissioner Doris, last year the administration put forth a list of violations that could be amended to give business owners an opportunity to correct the violation and avoid penalties. How did the administration identify or choose the violations on, that li on its list? And the second part of that, what were the factors considered when determining what type of relief was appropriate in each circumstance? And that's for you, Commissioner Doris. And then I have a follow-up question for both of you and then we'll pass it to my other colleagues. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Yeah, so look, SBS um, worked 
with our participating agencies, um, BSNY, DCWP, DOB, DEP, DOT, uh, to really uh, go over again some of those uh, particular violations that we believe um, will be uh, pertinent to businesses that businesses generally, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, were fined for, um, and also um, for us to uh, look at where we believe the greatest impact could be. And so out of the 73 uh, that we have, um, you know, we've already began working through those. Uh, more than half of them, we intend to have the others completed this year, as noted in my testimony. Um, and, uh, you know, in most cases, legislation um, is required to amend the administrative code. I know some DCWPs are in there, significant number, uh, a part of that list as well. Uh, in some cases, um, you know, require uh, amended rules, uh, which are associated with those, um, those particular uh, violations as well. In other cases, the administrative code. And so we just were uh, working with the agencies uh, to figure out, you know, what actually, um, you know, makes sense. And on the list, and by the way, uh, on the list that uh, the council currently has, um, we have about overlap of about 42 of the 181 that you have. So there's um, absolutely uh, some additional ones that we have identified that we would love to, to continue the conversation about working with the council on adding to your particular uh, list that you have as well. Um, and so we, we put the, the list together, everything from, you know, uh, location of the key of the boiler room, <laughs> Uh, to noise from the sound devices that we that are out there, things that are uh, should be curable, things that uh, we can work with uh, that doesn't impact uh, health and safety uh, and also uh, you know real quality of life issues. Uh, so that's how we we came up with uh, the list of seventy three and um, the various uh, you know reasons why we've done it. And again, the working with the agencies, what sort of a frequented uh, uh, violation that we can make the adjustments on and also um, where we think we might have a greater impact for the small business. Thank you, Commissioner. So my question to each of you, and I'll start with you, Commissioner Doris, and before I pass it over, uh, and you started touching on it, it's a great segue. Are there any other violations that you would suggest relief for which are not included in these bills? Uh, pure periods that would have the same result. Absolutely. So uh, again, we have, uh, I'm trying to do the math really quickly here. I mean, we've got an additional out of uh, the ones that don't overlap with what you presented, uh, an additional uh, 30, uh, 30 plus that we, we would love to, uh, to add on to your list as well. Uh, that doesn't overlap with our existing 73. So I, I think it's a great opportunity for us uh, to work through that. Thank you, Commissioner. And I'm looking forward to adding even more to that uh, list. Um, that's why that's the importance of this hearing. So we need to look at this holistically, collectively, to determine what the which is working together to achieve the result of easing burdensome regulations. Absolutely. Commissioner Salas, do you have any violations that you would suggest relief for which are not included in this bill? Chair Jenna, I, I would say again that we had identified 40 additional curable violations that uh, had were, were included in our CPL update, but are now part of your proposal too. Um, and we continue to think about any other uh, violations that again, prove burdensome to businesses, but are not causing harm to consumers and workers. And we'll be happy to continue to work with you. Uh, in the past, we also, work successfully together to repeal uh, licenses like the home improvement contractor salesperson license. And if there's any other ways that we can find, um, again, ways to relieve businesses, we'll be happy to do that. Thank you, Commissioner. Let me pass it back to uh, committee council uh, that'll call on my colleagues to have their own questions. I wanna thank both of you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I will now call on other council members to ask their questions in the order in which they raise the Zoom rant, uh, raise hand function. If you would like to raise, so if you'd like to ask a question, if you, you have not yet used the Zoom raise hand function, please raise it now. Uh, please begin delivering your questions, asking your questions once I have called on you. First, we'll hear from Councilmember Holden, please, and then followed by Councilmember Gibson. Council Thank, you for, 
Thank you for that, because I also believe Councilman uh, Holden, who is a cold, who is a cold crime on one of the bills, right to give a statement. Is that correct, Council Member? Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you for this important hearing, and thank you, Commissioners, for the testimony. Um, and even though our businesses could barely function through the pandemic, that has not stopped city regulators from finding restaurants and many other small businesses. According to the Wall Street Journal, from July through October, the City Health Department, which inspects restaurants, collected about $8.4 million in fines. Uh, the City Department of Consumer Affairs, which enforces uh, licensing and other regulations, collected $2.9 million during that period. Both agencies handle the most small business fines. The council understands, and everybody understands, that the economic lockdown imposed real costs on our businesses, and these bills are an important step in providing them some relief from regulatory burdens. The Department of Consumer Affairs aggressively targets businesses across the city. Intro 2233 brings timely reform to the notice of violation process by providing businesses a warning and time to correct serious issues, we are removing punitive fines while ensuring businesses are operating safely. During the pandemic, it has been tough to find something to do with your kids, right? Everybody, you know, was complaining about that, they're still complaining. Arcades and other family fund centers are hurting. They were closed all throughout the pandemic and they still haven't reopened. Um, this bill will remove needless licensing requirements on these types of businesses. We finally need government to listen to businesses and help address their day-to-day -day needs. We're heading in the right direction with these bills. But I, I just want to you know, ask Commissioner, Commissioner Salas because you, you mentioned that you know, you're trying to um, you know, protect the consumer. And I had a barbershop right across the street from my office, which I called your office about. I got a fine, a thousand dollar fine. It could be up to a thousand dollars for not keeping a journal um, in the proper format. He kept the journal in a copy book of his cleaning process. He didn't put it on official city letterhead or wherever form they had to put it on. And, and this was a type of violation that we saw over and over again with businesses uh, across the street. The nail salon got the same fine. Uh, we saw so many punitive fines. And Commissioner, these businesses were locked down for months. That means that barbershop, how many haircuts would he have to do to make up a thousand dollar fine? Uh, and he was closed for months. I mean, it just, there's no rhyme or reason to fining these businesses coming out of the pandemic because they didn't have a piece of paper on the window or they didn't have a, um, a, uh, a log in a special form that you require or that the agencies required. It's a little disingenuous to not say, yeah, let's work on this bill and let's, let's come up with something that we can agree on. Uh, I tried to call your office. I never got a call back. You were too busy. But I had so many businesses that were descended upon by your agency in particular that was punitive. And they complained to us. And you know what? We didn't really get satisfaction from the office, Commissioner. Thank and I'm you. not happy with your answers today, even. That you're you're saying, well, we don't we, we don't really know about this. We're, you know, we don't we don't know this is gonna, you know, this is a problem. This is a problem. You know what the problem is? The problem is when inspectors come out and punish businesses that have already been punished by a pandemic. That's the problem. And then when you get city agencies not listening, that's the problem. And then when you get commissioners that are saying, we're not sure about this, we need, you know, we, of course we wanna protect them against uh, price gouging. Of course we wanna do that. But there's a host of other violations that you could work with us and work with the businesses and you haven't. And this, this bill is necessary. These bills are necessary. But, uh, and so I'd I like to hear from the commissioner explain, because um, I was told that we're in a yellow zone, um, that we're, we were just lumped in. And that's why you descended on our, our, our businesses. 
Thank you, Council Member Holden, for your question. Um, so uh, first, let me just say that $2.9 million that was reported by the Wall Street Journal, we do not know what that number came from, to be honest, no one asked us. I will repeat what I said earlier, that uh, we um, were focusing, again, there was a, a decrease in the number of summonses last year by 50%. I will also say that oftentimes what people um, call uh, collections is a combination of, it could be fines, it could be uh, license fees, uh, payments that are overdue for years. But anyway, uh, we'll be happy to look at that number and come back to you and explain to you more what that means when, once we have an opportunity. With respect to the specific situation you mentioned, um, I can't, I, you know, cannot address specific cases, but I have to tell you that if it is a logbook um, and it was an inspection that we conducted, um, um, during the business reopening work, right? We were working under the guidelines set forth by the Office of Special Enforcement. Um, that office had help from different city agency inspectors to make sure our businesses were reopening uh, in a safe way, complying with all of the safety health regulations, guidelines that the state had published. Um, so therefore we were trying to follow and, and we, we had to follow the same guidelines that uh, were treating businesses equitably throughout the city. Uh, we certainly don't make decisions on those guidelines and we'll be happy to, uh, you so, know, so put in touch. You, so Commissioner, your inspectors have no discretion. No, sir. Um, from, from the office of uh, OSU, uh, what you just mentioned, the Office of Special Enforcement. Um, you have no, your, your, they have to give a fine, you're saying. We follow the guidelines, right? And I'd have to say, in some cases, we, if, you know, there was changing guidelines, of, you know, in, in some circumstances, and when that happened, and if anything was issued in error, we would have corrected that problem. But in this case, when our inspectors are in the field, they don't have a dis discretion to uh, go back and forth with the owner and try to negotiate any fines. They don't actually issue a fine. Oftentimes what they issue is just a notice of violation. The fine is then set by the Office of Administrative Trials and Hearings. So yeah. our inspectors don't have the discretion to start negotiating well, what the amount well, is. That's not what, that's not, and I've spoken to some, uh, that's not what I heard because some inspectors did warn cer certain businesses uh, and they were from your, your office, your agency. And then some businesses, when they did come into the area, were closed, like the barbershop. So he didn't get a warning. What he did get the next time they visited the next day was a violation. Uh, so th Can this I inconsistency, you just said that there's no discretion, but then they did well, use some discretion. Can I jump in? I, I do want to just make something very clear here. Um, public health and reopening guidelines, the protocols for enforcement are set by the mayor's office of special enforcement. Where we go as a regulatory agency, it leverages all the regulatory agencies in a global pandemic to ensure that there's enough sprawl so that we're getting out the appropriate guidance to small businesses if they are indeed in violation of public health guidelines. Um, I know that staff have, have been in touch with, with folks in your office, council members. In early December, there were, there were discussions between DCWP and, and your office. An overwhelming majority of public health inspections that, that we did and reopening guideline inspections that we did resulted in a warning. However, those warnings were pursuant to protocols and procedures that were set by the administration and the Office of Special Enforcement. We never... As, as the commissioner mentioned, we as an agency, DCWP, do not have the discretion in of ourselves to decide whether we're gonna issue a violation or a warning as it relates to this specific instance. Those protocols, those, uh, you know, and they did change and I understand and we're completely sympathetic to a, uh, to a public health crisis that has evolved over several months and those protocols changed perhaps from week to week and we, understand and sympathize with frustrations related to that, but in no way was that a DCWP inspector or any kind of directive from the commissioner on down to target or quote, descend on any business in your district or otherwise in the city. Well, that we, is we, I don't think anybody, and I think um, Councilman Gibson mentioned this, we don't even know the regulations and rules because you said they change from day to day. And then 
So some people get warnings and others don't. And I'd, I'd like to see this spelled out by maybe OSE could, maybe you can get us the regulations because we're not quite sure. And um, so I know some of the violations were overturned because they were written wrong or they were interpreted wrong. So all I'm asking, and I don't, maybe we should talk to uh, OSE, the mayor's office, but maybe we need a little more cooperation or education from, from businesses coming out of a pandemic. This is common sense, right? This is common sense. Why would you descend on these businesses and get them on a technicality, a thousand dollar fine? I don't care who, who's responsible, but I think then your, office, your agency has to talk to the mayor's office, OSE, and say, look, folks, let's, let's come together here. Let's figure something out. We can't penalize these businesses like this. I, we can't. I, it's the last thing we should be doing. So I completely agree. And I think the, the public health ordinances and the reopening guidelines are, are a very niche issue. And I think in general, en masse, our agency led by our commissioner have, has done more than anyone in recent history to ensure that we're doing education compliance for our small businesses. And I think one of the things that, that, that we've certainly taken the council's word on, certainly Chair Joe and I, in terms of the intent of the legislation put forward today, is to clarify these nuances. And I think on our end, we put together 40 curable violations that were adopted in the package before this. That cannot be lost here. Our commissioner and our staff have put forward and we've rescinded license categories over the last three, four years to ensure that small businesses are, over, are not overburdened. And we, as an agency, issued seven, uh, just over 7,000 summonses in 2020. That is definitely not the overwhelming regulation in, of small businesses in New York City. Well, so with all due respect, most of the businesses were closed. Come on. You know, no, but I, you but, can say the summonses are down, but they're, they're down because the businesses were closed most. Certainly. I think, right? I think what right? we're saying is that we're, we're just, we just wanted to clarify what was stated in an article that said that DC. No, everybody's doing a great job. I get it. I get it. Everybody's doing a great job. But we wouldn't have had these bills to be introduced and, and the hearing today if, if we felt that city agencies were listening. And I don't feel they were, including your agency. I didn't feel you were listening when you descended on businesses forever. And again, we're gonna to get to the bottom of the OSE, but um, it's just unfair. And I don't, you know, whoever's responsible, you're, if your agency is not yet, you did give warning. So I, I still want to look at this and why our businesses were just stepped on and kicked in the teeth when they shouldn't, when they were closed so long and they reopened, especially the barbershops and the nail salons and the small guys. I mean, you got to have some compassion here. But thank you, thank you, Commissioner. I appreciate your your answers, and thank you, Chair. I don't want to go on too long. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember. Next, we'll hear from Councilmember Gibson. Councilmember. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone, again, and thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councilmember Holden. A lot of uh, sentiments I want to echo as well. And I think at the end of the day, we are all trying to work together to do the very best. We understand that the city has to continue to operate. And we also know that there are rules that need to be followed. But I think we're trying to do our best to find a balance and not be punitive. There has to be some real relief given, recognizing the challenge that businesses have faced. They have been closed fully. Then they've been told to open 25%, 33%, 50%, back down to zero, back to 25 again. I mean, just to understand all of that is enough in itself. And I remind all of us, and you know, many of our small businesses in the outer boroughs are very small in operation. They have a handful of staff. Usually the operator is also the lawyer and the accountant, the bookkeeper, and they have multiple roles. So when you talk about all of these regulations to understand, if we have trouble understanding them as legislators, imagine how our small businesses feel in our communities. So. A lot of questions have been asked and I, I just have a few that I wanted to raise because I do want to understand that in the midst of this pandemic, our efforts to do outreach. So all of your agencies I've partnered with prior to the pandemic, when we were able to do walkthroughs and commercial visits, we've been walking up and down my community. I remember an effort by the Department of Consumer Affairs where we targeted some of our new businesses. And we went in and we gave them like kind of a welcome kit 
that talked about some of the rules and violations and things of that nature to kind of help them understand, almost like an orientation. So outside of that, what types of education and outreach have we done on the ground during this pandemic? Number one, to help the businesses understand some of their capacity issues that they've been experiencing. Um, I remind all of you of the major issue that we've been having just with commercial waste. Um, in terms of the pickup and the frequency of that. So I wanna hear from each of the agencies if you could just provide me with an understanding of coordinating with, with all of you and the businesses on the ground and outreach to really streamline things. Because all of you understand that it's not always the best relationship in terms of cooperative understanding and patience. I mean, a lot of it sometimes from the business's perspective, it comes off as punitive. You're only there when you're there to issue a fine. You pop up. You show up, they don't know you're coming, and then you catch people off guard. Um, so I just want to understand what the outreach has looked like on the ground in our communities during the pandemic. Uh, I'll, I'll take a crack at it first, uh, if that's okay, council member. I appreciate uh, uh, the question. Uh, you know, SBS, I mean, that's primarily, uh, as an advocate for small businesses, what we do. We want to also uh, educate our small businesses. And we've been doing that throughout the pandemic. Um, we've already delivered 110 services to businesses across the city. Uh, primarily, our hotline uh, was uh, instrumental. 55,000 businesses called in and it was help and were helped um, understanding the regulations. Uh, the number one thing was 60% of what they asked for was about, you know, understanding the regulations and how to, what we need to do to reopen. Um, and we took them through that process. Our, com our business advocates are on those lines, our, our compliance advisor on those lines. We also did webinars, so specific webinars uh, for um, businesses. Um, we've done uh, uh, partnerships with our agencies like DCWP, uh, literally, um, and uh, uh, walk in the streets with them as well in the communities um, to provide uh, the different resources and also um, not only the guides, the easy to read guides so that folks understand, uh, we did also um, met, meet with them um, in the webinars as well with multi-agency webinars to talk a little bit about uh, what the regulations were just to let businesses know. And that's 50,000 uh, attendees to those. So we wanna uh, you know, say that is very, very specific. Also our compliance advisors who are, are very specific in what they do. Um, uh, over a thousand or so businesses, uh, we've already reached out on the ground. Uh, and as you know, I've been uh, around the city um, as well in every corner of the city and every corridor, every borough, multiple times over 35, 36 corridor walks, thousands of businesses. And then we've got our um, compliance team and outreach team who went to the total of about 77 corridors. Uh, those, if you just do what the average about, you know, uh, you know, 20, 30, 40 businesses, uh, depending on the, the size of that corridor, uh, just on one side and the other side, uh, you, you're, you're, you're talking hundreds of businesses, um, you know, in, in every, every other week or so. So we're, we're, we're touching these businesses, we were on the ground, and we were very, very uh, strategic in our outreach efforts, knowing that we had a hotline, uh, we promoted it at every turn, uh, we also was out in the field and in multiple languages, by the way, um, our ER, ERU, our emergency response uh, team as well, um, was on the ground uh, when we had a crisis of looting. And also even now with, the, uh, with fires and other types of emergencies, we're on the ground. And every time we go, we also bring uh, the resources about the pandemic. So certainly agree with you on, on the necessity for businesses to understand regulations. But even with that, we understand that there's clearly more that we continue to do. And that's what we're doing now, making sure uh, that that's why we agree with the, the intent of this legislation. Again, uh, to clarify, we have our own list. You have a list, I think, combining them together uh, will be great for us to continue to uh, you know, uh, fight uh, for our small businesses and be advocates for them while also explaining to them what the current rules and regulations are. And I'm happy to just add a couple of things from DCWP's perspective. As I mentioned earlier, um, we conducted since June last year, so when the city began reopening, um, we conducted 33 business education days. Uh, nine of them were in the Bronx, uh, another nine in Brooklyn, 
uh, seven or actually seven in Queens and an additional event, um, Manhattan six, Staten Island two. Those are again, those business education days are walkthroughs that are purely about education and outreach. Our inspectors, um, we have usually someone from our visiting inspector program who comes with us. I come on those um, walks. We partner with council members, elected officials in those areas. And it's simply about going door to door, giving time to those businesses to ask questions, to get the materials they need, to get contact information from people at my agency that they can email or call directly if they have follow-up questions, right? We did another 510 outreach virtual events that were purely about uh, communicating, uh, again, trying to demystify, demystify all of the um, lines that had published for businesses to reopen safely and to talk also about paid sick leave compliance, a very important law that both uh, employers and workers had questions about. Uh, additionally, we did um, visiting inspector program uh, inspections. That is reserved purely for new licensees. So anyone who first got a license beginning in the year, believe it or not, some businesses continue to get licenses throughout the pandemic and those businesses all uh, received um, a visit, dedicated visit from a um, seasoned inspector um, to learn about their businesses um, compliance with laws and regulations. We did 1500 of those. Those are all personal touch one-on-one -on -one type of events. That's in addition to any other outreach that we've done or work that we've done together with the Office of Special Enforcement um, and SBS. Okay, I appreciate all of that. And I know that your agencies have been doing a lot of these webinars and informationals in multiple languages, um, but certainly it's, it's great, but you know, we always have to strive to do a lot more because there are still businesses that we still have yet to touch. And I worry about interagency coordination. Every agency is, providing a service and fulfilling its responsibility. But there are many instances where we are not talking to each other. And that bothers me to no end. Uh, Interagency coordination is so important because you have many businesses that have multiple agencies that oversee them. And I don't know if DSNY is on here, but that has been a grave concern around sanitation. These tickets that are being issued are disturbing. Um, they are enormous and many of them to me are punitive and businesses are responsible for their outdoor as well as interior and they're being fined for garbage that's not theirs, for violations that doesn't belong to them. And th there has been this system that you know we've kind of encouraged that we really have to change the behavior on. So I wanted to ask two quick final questions. Uh, the advocacy and the outreach to immigrant owned businesses specifically. And I know some of your agencies have specific initiatives that work with the immigrant owned uh, operators. And then I also want to ask about MWBE, one of my favorite topics. Are there any specific programs or initiatives that we have in place pre-pandemic as well as during the pandemic that will help many of our MWBEs and immigrant businesses that will say they don't have the money to pay these fines, uh, the time frame on curing that violation, they need extended time. Are we working with them? Are we giving them flexibility? How is all of that happening with many of our immigrant owned and MWBE businesses? Uh, thank you for that uh, question. Uh, so, you know, generally, as you know, um, being, uh, the city's first senior advisor and director of the mayor's office of MWBE, where we saw a triple utilization of our MWBEs. And uh, I think by the time we left 14 billion, uh, this is a big concern out for us. And uh, we know, um, generally speaking, within uh, the MWBE community and, and overall, overall uh, 50% or so of New York City small businesses uh, or foreign born or immigrants. Um, and so uh, the significant portion of our work that we do uh, ties into the immigrant community. Uh, we, uh, we are very clear on the language access component of our work, which is uh, critical to what we do, um, how we communicate out and, and also by doing uh, these outreach and also providing resources in languages that uh, they, they do understand 
and also um, they're comfortable with, we are able to assist those businesses. From the MWBE standpoint, uh, we do have uh, here at, the, at SBS, we do have our MWBE program and compliance program and also our, um, our uh, capacity building programs, extensive programs, uh, a dozen or more programs where we help uh, these MWBEs. If you are an MWBE with the city and you have a contract with us, you, uh, we uh, adjusted during the pandemic that the, the, what we call a contract finance loan fund that uh, helps MWBEs to fulfill their requirement with the city uh, to provide the contract and services uh, where you could get up to a million dollars in a calendar year uh, at 0% interest, 0%. And so, uh, you know, we do uh, very much uh, work with our MWBE and immigrant owned businesses in particular. One, the access, make sure they understand what uh, is available to them. Uh, two, on the capacity building programs. Three, on the access to capital. Uh, programs. Uh, we've already assisted uh, New York City small businesses, 5135 or so million dollars uh, connecting them and, and also working with our CDFI, our community development financial institutions that actually deal with those particular uh, uh, communities such as Renaissance and, and Axion, which is Ascendance now, and, and, and True Fund and others uh, that we work with that really deal with those uh, specific uh, communities. And we will uh, certainly continue to do that and double down on our efforts, but we were very strategic, um, even with the, the programs that we put out, uh, making sure that we are targeting the areas uh, that we know that needed the most, you know, high COVID impact areas, which also layered high immigrant communities, which also layered on top of, uh, you know, minority uh, of businesses and women owned businesses. And so um, we were very focused on that. Okay. Anyone else? Um, just to make sure. This is Laura Salas. Um, so similarly, um, a lot of our business education work were in those same neighborhoods where we saw the highest rates of COVID-19 infections. So the neighborhoods where our uh, black and brown communities live, our immigrants live. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm an immigrant myself. I understand how important it is to bridge the language gap, but not, not just that, it's also important to make sure that we um, as government agencies are seen as accessible. So we take that very seriously. Um, a lot of our the collaborations with the bids, you know, we often have to bring and do bring inspectors um, to our walks that speak multiple languages. We're often a combination of Spanish, Chinese, and Urdu, and we come out and we are trying to serve every small business owner who wants to ask us questions. So we're very committed to that work. We always go far above the 10, um, you know, we're required to translate on our materials into 10 languages approximately. We often have 14, 15, 20 languages translated, even some that are indigenous languages because we know how important it is to be accessible and to provide information in, in a way that's understood by our businesses. Okay, great. Um, the final question I have, obviously the council wants to work with you. So any suggestions you all have for us on what we can do to even, you know, strengthen this legislation before us, but also the education and outreach. We are uh, starting our budget hearings tomorrow for FY22. So this is the opportunity for all of you to present your budget priorities and certainly coming off of, you know, FY21, a lot of painful cuts some programs that had to absorb cuts, which we were not happy about. We obviously want to have those conversations again moving forward. Um, and in the COVID-19 recovery, I think our work e is even more important because we have to be creative now. We can't gather and join in large spaces, but we still have to reach people on the ground. The final question I have this is a tough one, get ready. Um, it is challenging for me to understand as a city, how can we better as city agencies continue to work with our state partners? So there are state agencies that also have oversight on our businesses and their own rules that are different from ours. And they don't necessarily talk to us. Um, it is frustrating sometimes when I hear from businesses, my colleagues will allude to this, that are restaurants and others, and they have been visited by the state liquor authority and their licenses have been revoked, they've been fined. Um, and that, you know, there are things that are happening. So I wonder from your perspective, what can we do as a city to improve our partnerships and collaborations with the state? 
how can we help as a city council? Because it is enough to deal with the thousands of regulations in the city, let alone having to deal with state agencies on your back as well. Um, so if you can just give me some ideas, some suggestions in this moment to see how we can go about working better with the state so that there is some coordination, some partnership, a conversation so that we are at least on the same page to the best extent as possible. <laughs> um, if you don't well, mind, Janelle, if I can jump in first, my sure. computer is dying. Um, just quickly, I want to say, I don't have any brilliant ideas for you, Council Member Gibson, about that. We Me do, <laughs> We do, however, enforce some state laws. You know, as DCWP, we have actually um, uh, um, uh, the delegation to enforce uh, the state tobacco laws, for instance, right? So, um, so there's some synergies there, and it, you know we could potentially sit down and, and discuss some more whether there are other ways to collaborate further with the state, um, so that yeah, there's more consistency. I appreciate that, and I I just want to say. Um, uh, one last point is that we certainly think we can accomplish both goals, uh, what you're set out to do, which is provide small business relief and strengthen our consumer protection law for those uh, types of issues that our consumers many times are uh, limited English proficient consumers who are also oftentimes small business owners, right? You're, we're all consumers, right? Um, and this, the updates that we're proposing under 1622 would actually make it so that consumers that are targeted in their language uh, get important key contractual documents in their languages and that online transactions are clearly covered under the statute. We know that our most bu small businesses have to compete with the big online retailers. It is just there that the online retailers are also subject to our consumer protection law. So uh, I look forward to working with all of you in achieving that right balance. Thank you. Thank you. I agree and I appreciate you saying that commissioner and I again I know that we are moving to these online retailers and flagship stores, but there is nothing that provides a better human connection and consistency than a local merchant and a local small Absolutely. business. Absolutely. Um, and that will always be the case. And I think every effort that we undertake is to really try to find balance, to understand rules have to be followed, but we don't wanna be punitive in enforcing those rules. And we can do this in a right way that's fair, that's balanced, that provides equity. And, and certainly Chair Jonai and I, uh, as well as Council Member Holden, we're out of boroughs, you know? And so we don't always get access to everything that comes to a central location. So we need special services. We need extra services. Uh, we're very unique in nature in, in the Bronx. And when you look at some of the, you know, loans and grants that we were not given access to less than 10%. It's alarming and it reminds us that a lot of work must be done. So I think this is a good conversation, a good way to start. I'm looking forward to seeing where this goes. Uh, we want to keep working with you because we believe that these bills put forth today are a good platform, a good conversation to take us to an environment where we can provide the much needed relief uh, to give small businesses the support that they have rightfully deserved all this time during a pandemic. So I thank you everyone. Thank you to the team and thank you Chair Jonai for your time today. And I look forward to working with all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, council member. I'll now turn it over to the chair to say a few words before we move to public testimony. Chair. Thank you. I wanna thank uh, council member Gibson and council member Holden um, for their input. I wanna thank both commissioners um, the time they spent with us and the willingness that they're showing up forward. Not only look at these 183 proposed bills, uh, pieces of regulation, how many more of the 6,000 can we really look at uh, that would give our small businesses a fighting chance, whether it be a cure period uh, or uh, removing outdated regulations that no longer should apply, uh, including the one that uh, we all highlighted on sanitation. It's one thing for tickets to be issued for dirty sidewalks. Now, the Commissioner of Sanitation is not here, so I don't expect either one of you to answer. But during the height of this pandemic, when our businesses were closed and our streets were dirtier than ever, this administration removed garbage cans from our street corners. Well, what did you think the outcome would be? Of course, it would be more limited. And to penalize property owners and small businesses 
for the litter in front of their establishments when they were closed, forced closed, and shut down is unfair. And I'll point out another uh, that was brought to my attention, and I'm sure we'll hear many more today of unfair practices of violations. There was a um, small business, a fast food establishment, that during the pandemic, the height of the pandemic, installed plexiglass to protect employees and customers at the register. The fire department, which the commissioner is not here, made an inspection and issued a $5,000 fine for temporary plexiglass that was put in place to protect consumer and employee and comply with the COVID policy of protecting both. These are outrageous examples of what has been going on in New York City. And I'm gonna ask that both of you or your team uh, stick around to hear from those that are going to testify today as they share their horror stories um, during the COVID experience as well as throughout the decades. Commissioner Salas, can you tell me the revenue that uh, Consumer Affairs has generated in calendar year uh, 2019 uh, through the form of fines and, and issuance of violations? Do you have that information? I am. I had to move to charge my laptop. I'm really sorry. Um, Steve or Mike, do we have that information? I'm not sure that we do. So in terms of fines that were collected, uh, it's fines been, that were, there's a difference between collected and fines that were issued. So I just want to know the total dollar amount of fines that were issued. Oh, yeah. Do you have it, Steve? Yeah, right. I'm okay. Let me just... Uh, one second. Sorry about that. So I we have the we have a, a twenty twenty number of fines issued, but we may have to get back to you on on twenty nineteen. What was the what was the twenty twenty fines issued by Consumer Affairs? So, in I'm sorry, Commissioner. Did you want to? No, I, I think the, only, the only number I had was sort of the number of summonses issued, right? And that's what I said during my testimony that number of summonses issued in 2019 were 16,154 summonses, and in 2020 it was 7,176 summonses. That doesn't tell you the full, like the number amount of the fines. I don't have that in front of me and I'm not sure if we do for today. Yeah, for, for 2020 in terms of fines issued, the number is gonna be uh, a, pro, around 20, 24 million, but I wanna couch that in a couple of ways. One, fines issued is a very particular term that doesn't, re, that doesn't speak to what, what uh, small businesses ultimately um, had to deal with on the back end after after a fine is adjudicated, for example, there's a hearing process, as you know, chair at oath and uh, small businesses are given the opportunity to either settle or to or to argue their case before an independent tribunal. And then uh, a majority of those fines in particular fines issued in 2020 related to um, uh, infractions such as uh, tobacco uh, sales infractions, where you're where you're talking about underage sales to minors, um, uh, ceiling violations, and, and things of that nature. So I'm happy to. I think you know I'm happy. I, I want to have a protracted conversation with you about like the breakdown of that, um, and and uh, we can certainly work with you and your staff to kind of to kind of give you a further breakdown and give you the 2019 number as well. Thanks, Steve. The point I was making, so uh, you issued 7,176 violations, which netted a revenue for dollar amount, total dollar amount of violations issued, 24 million. Uh, looking at uh, calendar year 2000, am I correct there? Well, it would, it, it's not necessarily revenue for us. Those are what, that's what the, that, those are like the fines that would be issued. But again, it doesn't speak to like the like issue. Sort of like issued only, not correct. Right. Revenue would be a much smaller number potentially. So issued, yeah. 
dollar amount of fines issued compared to 2019, which was 16,000, which I'm gonna assume was double that dollar amount of issued violations, which would put it in the neighborhood of 50 million. And I just wanna point out that although that's a major reduction, that's a tremendous increase from 2012 when the total dollar amount of fines issued was 14 million. So before we start patting ourselves on the back to say what a great job we're doing to you know, stop issuing fines across small businesses, in 2012, at the start of this administration, it was 14,000. So our 2019, and I'm not sure if that was the year with the height, went to 16,000 violations and using just the basic math, that would be four times, or at least three times the amount of 2012, and you're back down to 24 million. We've got a long ways to go. Yeah. We, have a, we have plenty to work with. And I'm gonna ask both commissioners to keep an open, open mind, and open invitation as we look at the roughly 6,000 rules and regulations, which ones we can take off the books, and I hope to add a zero to the 183. I'm hopeful that we can actually make it 1,000 violations that we can, regulations that we can move penalties from that we can give cure periods to and still achieve the same result. So I want to thank both of you for your time and your input and the work that we have ahead. Because Dick, the importance of this hearing is to outline the framework that we have moving forward to remove these regulations that are truly crushing our small businesses. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. I'll pass it back to the committee council. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Joni. We will now turn to public testimony. I'd like to remind everyone that unlike our typical council hearings, we will be calling on individuals one by one to testify. Each panelist will be given three minutes to speak. Please begin once the sergeant has started the timer. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the raise hand function in Zoom and I will call on you after the panelist has completed their testimony. For panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the Sergeant at Arms will give you the go ahead to begin upon setting the timer. Please wait for the Sergeant to announce that you may begin before delivering your testimony. I would like to now welcome Robert Bookman to testify. After Robert, I will be calling on Andrew Ridgey and then I Young Kim. Robert? Starting time. Hi, right, thank you very much. I will need a couple more than three minutes. Uh, my name is Robert Bookman. Uh, I am an attorney. I am counsel to the New York City Hospitality Alliance, as well as the New York City New State Operators Association. Uh, I am also the counsel appointee to the Health Department Advisory Board and the counsel, appoint, uh, counsel appointee to the Nightlife Advisory Board. And I have been dealing with this issue and working with the council for decades now. Uh, a little history I think would be helpful. The legislation, this legislation is the culmination of over 15 years of work with the city council, which has slowly been moving the ball forward on regulatory reform. Going back to Speaker Gifford Miller, when he asked me for a list of silly and outdated laws and regulations to eliminate, to Speaker Quinn, who actually passed over the objections from Mayor Bloomberg, a number of regulatory reforms, uh, to Speaker Corey Johnson, who has made this a priority and whose support we greatly appreciate in this effort, as well as you, Chair Joni. Uh, it's important to remember that in the last year of Mayor Bloomberg's final term, this council passed legislation very similar to what we're looking at now, requiring multiple agencies that regulate small businesses to report to the council within six months a list of laws and regulations where fines could be eliminated and replaced with warnings and an opportunity to cure. Having objected to this legislation, Mayor Bloomberg made sure that the agencies gave the most minimal response possible when it reported, listing only sign violations. And even then, the health department was excluded altogether by the mayor. E yet even that legislation saved millions of dollars on needless fines for first time violations on signs, signs that often no one even reads. At that time, public advocate and mayoral candidate Bill de Blasio was highly critical of Mayor Bloomberg and his agencies for its addiction to fines. He even issued a report where he complained that the council as well as the mayor needed to do more to reduce fines, what he called a hidden tax on small businesses. 
He correctly argued that the laws needed to be changed. He was right then. The laws needed to be changed. And unfortunately, they still do. Because while policies of this administration may have reduced fines somewhat in the past seven years in some areas, they are still way too high. And policies can change overnight and with every administration. We need the laws to be changed once and for all. And that is what you are starting today. A fundamental change of the relationship between city government and small businesses from the traditional one of fines, fines and more fines to one that stresses compliance as the goal and, and, and have that compliance achieved not with fines, but with education and opportunities to cure and warnings, reserving fines only for the most egregious violations and repeat offenders. Education first makes sense during the pandemic, but it also makes sense every day. A few, put I'm some of this in context, put some of these fines in context. As cited by the Public Advocate's own report from 2013, consumer affairs revenue, and by the way, they seem to, be, it's shocking to me that they didn't come, that they came to a hearing today without revenue figures when this is a bill about full small fine revenues. In any event, the revenues from consumer affairs was two, $4 million in 2002. It jumped at the end of 2012 to $14 million. So if they've come down to about $10 million in revenue, good for them, but that's still a lot more than 4 million in 2002 when Bloomberg went on his tear. And the health department was even worse. In 2002, they had $8 million in fines against the restaurant industry, the most famous restaurant industry in the world. That went up to $52 million a year in 2012. The health department advisory board, which I am on representing you, that number at the end of 2019, the real numbers, the 2020, which is pandemic numbers, don't mean anything, was around 30 million. So yes, we went down from 52 million in large part because laws passed by the city council in the last year of Bloomberg administration over his objection, such as example, no fines if you get an A, uh, moving the hearings from the health department's own hearing offices to oath, where those hearing offices are more independent. So those fines have come down to 30 million. They've come down to 30 million from from $8 million when nobody was dropping dead in the streets from tomaine poisoning in the city of New York, and they're still not. We, the legis but this legis so we need to put all that in context. The le this legislation accomplishes many discuss goals discussed over the decades. It allows for warnings for the most minor violations. It allows an opportunity to cure. And most importantly, it reduces the maximum fine that can be imposed at a hearing on some other violations. This is critical because the agencies over the years, by rule and by policy, have been increasing the fines without council action. And they've been doing that by raising the minimum that the ALJ can impose. So for example, if you in the law have a fine range of zero to 200, that means it could be anywhere from, excuse me, no more than $200 is what the statute would say. That means it could be anywhere from zero to 200. But what the agencies have been doing by policy and regulation is they've been raising that, that uh, minimum to, let's say, $100. So now it's not zero to 200, it's 100 to 200. And by doing that, they've been raising revenue without the council acting. This bill would end that injustice. It's important to note, by the way, that particular violations listed in the legislation, and you asked these agencies over and over again, especially in health and, and consumer affairs. This is a good starting point, but only a starting point. There are many, many more small business violations which should be subject to a warning or an opportunity to cure rather than a fine, hundreds more. And we look forward to working with the committee and your staff in identifying those additional rules and regulations. A couple of quick examples. A sidewalk newsstand got a violation because a bag of potato chips was sticking out a couple of inches too, too far. That, I think, could get a warning. Um, another sidewalk newsstand one, and it is a consumer protection law, an inspector did an undercover inspection, couldn't find anything wrong, bought a bottle of water and didn't get a receipt. So he gave him a consumer protection law violation for not issuing a receipt. How many times have you ever asked for a, <laughs> for a receipt from a sidewalk newsstand? I know I never have. Um, Finally, I just want to conclude with a, a couple of uh, quotes, actually, from then public advocate Mayor de Blasio. And I appreciate your extra time uh, because he, he really said it best when he when he was advocating for for this. He said, 
New York City cares less about enforcing the laws than it does about raising revenue any way it can. All these fines belie the myth that New York City hasn't increased taxes in recent years. On the contrary, these hidden taxes have been hurting businesses more and more with every passing budget. City Hall now counts on the annual haul from fines, just like it does any other tax. It budgets for the revenue it needs at the beginning of the year, and then it sends out inspectors on a mission to bring back the dough. But when aggressive fines prevent employers from adding new staff or drive them to shut their doors, we can't look the other way. It's long past time to shine, shine some sunlight on what this hidden tax is doing to struggling business across the city. He wrote that in 2012. And I'll conclude with his final statement. We cannot hold small businesses hostage to the city's budget. It's time to stop treating small businesses like an ATM and take an honest look at what the fines are really costing the city. We can protect New Yorkers without running neighborhood business into the ground. I couldn't say it any better myself. Thank you. I'm happy Robert, to answer any questions you have. Thank you so much for just being a, a hair over the three-minute time allocation. <laughs> Robert, I just want to correct you on something that the commissioner's uh, team just pointed out. Consumer Affairs in uh, calendar year 2020, the total dollar amount of fines that were issued was $24 million. That was just made public, and that's still uh, from the 2012, I believe you mentioned 14 million. Yeah, a lot, so, uh, yeah well, that's apples and oranges, though. A lot of uh, so I'm major talking about actual yeah. revenue collected um, went from four to 14 million, and it may have gone down a couple of million in the last seven years, but it's nowhere near four million. A lot of these violations, as uh, you know, uh, as, as Councilman Holden said, get dismissed. They're written improperly. Um, and it often, you know, so that figure to me and what we've always counted is revenue collected against small businesses. And that and that burst like never before under Bloomberg when we were not at a lawless city. We need to get back as a, as a baseline to fiscal year 2002, where health department fines were eight million dollars, where consumer affairs fines were four million dollars and other agencies were much lower as well. When we get back to that. It'll be an accomplishment. Robert, I'm looking forward to working on uh, regulations that we can agree that should be reduced in not only or removed from the books, but definitely reduced in the form of the penalties that are assessed. So we've got a lot of work ahead. I want to thank you. Thank Robert. you. I, I really, you know, I've been testifying before the council for over 30 years now, ever since I left Consumer Affairs. And I want to tell you that this law has the potential to being one of the most significant pieces of small business legislation that I have ever testified it could fundamentally change the way small businesses interact with local government. And I, and I commend you all for it. Your lips to God's ears, Robert. Let's see what it looks like at the end of the day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Next Thank we'll you, Council. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Andrew Ritchie, Ai Young Kim, and then Michael Brady. Andrew? Starting time. Good afternoon. I'm Andrew Ritchie, the Executive Director of the New York City Hospitality Alliance. So, uh, you know, I don't know how much more to follow up after our Council Robert Bookman's comments and then couple those with uh, Mayor de Blasio's comments when he was public advocate. I think it really says it all. Uh, New York City restaurants and other small businesses have felt for too long that they are the personal ATM of the city. It does not have to be this way. We have been advocating for many years to look at the countless fines that are issued to these small businesses and those that don't pose an immediate hazard to the health of the public or to workers should have what is sensible, a cure period or a warning. And that's exactly what this legislation does. That's why we support it. And that's why we need to fundamentally change the way city government interacts with our local businesses. When you speak with them, the frustration, the amount of time that they spend paying fines, paying people to defend these fines over the years uh, is just astronomical. And this legislation is so critically important and we need to use this opportunity. You know, one of the bills today will provide uh, refunds for fines that were issued that shouldn't have been issued really during the pandemic, but it also seeks the other bill uh, to fix these long-standing inequities, these long-standing regulatory burdens that have plagued our industry. I mean, the numbers really are outstanding if you think about them. Back in early 2000s, 
less than $10 million in fines issued by the city health department. In 2012, it skyrocketed to over 50 million, and now it's come down to 30 million? Yeah, the reduction's good, but we are so far past where we should have ever been in the first place. We need to ensure that anything we do with this legislation really gets to the core, and as Rob Bookman said, gets us back to those fine levels in the early 2000s. And I think another part that we need to address is not only the fines, but changing the interactions that our small business owners, our workers have with inspectors. You hear, and I've heard from inspectors, that they feel that if they go in and focus on education and training and don't issue fines, it's going to be a problem. It's almost like they're not doing their job. And you hear from restaurant owners and other small business owners who say, it's like when the inspector comes in, they just feel like they have to issue me violations because if they go back and they don't, well, then it appears they're not doing their job. So there's this incredible tense relationship that exists between the businesses and the inspectors. But by building in warnings, cure periods, reducing or eliminating fines for basic types of violations, you change the dynamic. And that we can focus on education and training instead of jumping to punitive measures. An inspector should come in. This is why it's a violation. This is how to correct this violation. And if I come back in the future and it's not corrected, well, perhaps then you'll get I'm expired. And the fines need to be associated with the level of violation. So all in all, I just want to say that we're thankful to Chair Joni, Council Member uh, Gibson, of course, the Speaker, and so many other Council Members I see Holden and others on here that are really fighting to use this as an opportunity to fundamentally change the way city government regulates our small business community. And when we are on the other side of this pandemic, we want to be able to look back and say we took the momentum we had and we made changes to make New York City more supportive of our small businesses because over the past year, more than 140,000, 140,000 New Yorkers working in our cities, restaurants and bars have lost their jobs. Thousands of our beloved local eating and drinking spots have shuttered so many more on the edge of survival. We deserve to pass this legislation for them and for our city. And we look forward to working to make sure that all the fines or violations that should allow cure periods, warnings, eliminate fines, is included in this legislation. So I want to thank you all again. And uh, once again, New York City Hospitality Alliance strongly supports both pieces of legislation. Look forward to working to their ultimate passage and being signed by Mayor de Blasio into law. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you so much. We've got our work cut out for us. Thank you, Andrew. Next, we'll hear from Ah Young Kim, followed by Michael Brady and then David Estrada. Ah Young? Starting time. Thank you, Chair Joe and I, for this important hearing and the opportunity to testify. My name is Ayan Kim, and I am the Associate Director of Small Business Programs at the Asian American Federation. Asian small business owners across the city have consistently contacted the Federation to share their concerns about city agency practices and enforcing regulations, even before the pandemic brought our economy to a screeching halt. Immigrant small business owners have been struggling with lack of language access, adequate informational outreach, inconsistent or hostile inspection practices, and little guidance on how to navigate the city agency system to follow up on violations. While the intent behind city agencies efforts to assist small businesses are well understood, and we, we, we must still recognize the level of engagement and this, in such programs for the immigrant small business community remains very low. I appreciate the concerns and every horror story we heard in this sharing by the chair and council member Holden and Gibson. For our community, you can assume the same problems, but double the pain. There is simply not enough meaningful outreach to the immigrant small business community to overcome the fear of inviting an inspector to nor they normally see as a figure of authority. There is also no way for our small business owners to hold an inspector accountable in the case of hostile or unfair inspection practices. This struggle for our small business community has only deepened over the duration of this pandemic. And in a rushed enforcement of the COVID-19 related regulations, inspectors gave verbal instructions to immigrant small business owners with limited English capacity, and then later held them accountable for not adhering to these instructions that they could not understand. Inspectors of various task forces and agencies 
made multiple rounds of inspection in a short span of time and often gave wrong or contradictory information, which fomented a sense of insecurity and lack of trust in the community. Our business owners would call me to ask how come inspectors are so punitive and so uncooperative when the mayor is pro promising support for small businesses to survive this pandemic. So we welcome this first important step towards lessening the unfair burdens and our small business community faces today. Our community needs the support and recognition for their contribution and the challenges they face. We are encouraged to see this effort in reviewing city agency regulations and look forward to working closely with you to ensure immigrant small business communities most pressing regulatory concerns are heard and addressed. We see a lot of room for new regulations and uh, to be considered as well. Going forward, we request the council to actively reach out to immigrant small business owners through CBOs and business groups who already established a trusting relationship with the community. We also welcome the discussion of waiving civil penalties on the first time offenses. This is something we have been pushing for for a long time and we are very happy to see this. This effort gives a recognition to the small business owners who have been struggling to survive this pandemic, all the while doing their best to cooperate with this fast time changing expired. regulations to keep their community safe. If I may um, say my recommendations. Um, yes, please, Ms. Kim. Uh, thank you. Um, we have uh, four recommendations in the, in the light of the challenges that we feel on the Asian American small business community. First of all, we urge the council to actively invite immigrant small business owners or their business groups for an open conversation and feedback on the regulations under review. Many of these industries in the city are disproportion disproportionately represented by immigrant communities of certain ethnicity, and a lot of these groups don't have legal counsel or somebody to represent them in every single hearing. We need to reach out to them actively. Second, provide meaningful language support for the immigrant small business community to ensure timely outreach and information dis dis dissemination. We appreciate the appointment of the Asian liaison uh, in the SBS and his outre outreach work that has shown that it is possible to engage our small business owners more directly. We request the council to uh, support this effort and to expand this effort to appoint more liaisons with language capacity with working directly with small business owners. Third, we request the council to allow ample time for cure period. While 30 days may seem like a long time, administrative barriers and lack of procedural assistance requires more time for immigrant small business owners to cure a standing violation. And lastly, we'd like to ask that the council to commit to better inform small business owners of their rights, such as the right to language access or the right to ask for the inspector to show an ID card before entering a business um, practice or demanding to see the back um, behind the scenes of the business itself. We want to make sure that the council, uh, we want to make sure that our small business owners have a fair chance and also the access to make sure that they can cure violations as you intend. Thank you again for this opportunity to testify. Thank you, Ms. Kim. We're going to continue the dialogue, and I'm looking forward to working with you as we uh, look at the bills and the impact that these bills can have on our small business community, especially our immigrant small business community. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you uh, Young. Next, we'll hear from Michael Brady, followed by David Estrada, and then Kendra Hems. Michael? Starting time. Good afternoon, Chair Jonai and members of the New York City Council Committee on Small Business. Specifically, um, special thanks to Councilmember Holden, Councilmember Gibson, and Councilmember Perkins. I do have to say I'm a bit shocked at the lack of attendance by other council members after the last stated where so many members of the Progressive Caucus said that during the March stated they were going to get serious about small business, but c'est la vie. We see how serious they are. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak on the recently introduced legislation for small businesses, specifically intro 2233 and 2234. Before starting, I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge the anniversary of the first case of COVID-19 in New York City and the catastrophic loss of life that has severely shaped how our city prepares for and reacts to disasters. So many New Yorkers have died and the economic and public health impact of this disease rages on in our communities. My personal thoughts are with every family member who's lost a loved one and every individual that's grappling with the economic fallout of this pandemic. My name is Michael Brady. I'm the CEO of the Third Avenue Business Improvement District in Bruckton Boulevard Commercial Corridor located in the South Bronx. Collectively, these organizations represent roughly 1,000 South Bronx largely immigrant-owned mom and pop businesses. 
I am here today to lend our organization support of intro 2233 and 2234 as part of what I hope will be followed by a series of common sense policies and rollbacks which genuinely prioritize small businesses and local economies and attempt to counter a decade of punitive measures that have been placed on small and micro business owners. The introduction of this legislation is a significant step forward and must be accompanied by a pro small business policy, which cultivates a message accompanied by actions which clearly state that New York City is open for business. It should be noted that after hearing the administration's testimony today, out of the 6,000 plus New York City regulations for New York City small businesses, that the administration has been able to come up with a list of approximately 80 acceptable legislation that they deem curable. That's after they've had over a year and a half to analyze that. I'm not a mathematician, but I would say the administration's actions and analysis are slow and disingenuous. In business, we would say uh, that their analysis has no timely value add. Over the past decade, the anti-small business sentiment in New York City has had a damning impact on our neighborhoods and local economies. While educational tours have been refreshing, they're often little more than handing out flyers and face masks during 2020. The commissioners, as you, as you have heard, call this touching businesses. To compound matters, often these tours, unknown to the agency staff, were followed up by inspectors the next day, which very often find the very businesses that were being, uh, which were being educated just the day before. You can see where this lack of communication between agencies would appear unstable. Time expire and unfair to small business owners. These two bills that are, are, are being presented today are, me, are a meaningful part of countering a decade of neglect where small businesses were seen as the proverbial piggy bank and not the foundational investment for our city's neighborhoods. I would caution that the success of intro to, uh, 2233 and 2234 is all about the rollout and getting into the weeds. Refunds on violations must be easy to, easy to submit, language ready, and take into account the severe digital divide that exists in our city, a divide that this administration has not yet fixed. It cannot be onerous, and refunds must be properly, uh, processed swiftly if these bills have any hope of having positive impact. Education for businesses must be timely, readily available, language ready, online and in person, and speak to the communities that the small businesses serve. They must also include robust communication between agencies, which at present is, short, is sorely lacking. The COVID-19 pandemic and a decade of anti-small business sentiment created a perfect storm that has led to the closure of over 30% of New York City's small businesses, only higher in industry-specific areas like hospitality and hotels. We need to fix this and fix it quickly. It is time for New York City to put small businesses first, prioritize business needs, grants, and capital over progressive sound bites. This is also a warning for the incoming class of city council representatives. Legislation has con uh, consequences that far outlast your time in government. Smart legislators will evaluate those consequences and not stick their heads in the stand. Climbers seeking higher office without properly evaluating legislative impact beyond the term in office will continually be a detriment to New York City's growth and ability for small businesses to succeed. Small businesses are in the struggle of their lives. We must mobilize every tool quickly and efficiently to protect as many small businesses as we can, and also, deep, and also deeply engage with entrepreneurs to fill the market gap left by so many closures over the past year. The public health impact has been great, and the subsequent economic impact will have a lasting impact on our city for at least a decade. It is my hope that this body not only understands the severity of COVID-19's impact, but will take meaningful and purposeful steps to implement a comprehensive plan to address it. These two bills represent a step in that direction. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. And Councilman uh, Joan, I, on a personal note, I was saddened to hear that you will not be running for re-election. You are, have been a tenacious and fierce advocate for small businesses. And um, I am personally fearful of the next class of council members who are coming in, but I am grateful for your leadership. Thank you so much. Thank you, Michael. Next, we'll hear from David Estrada, followed by Kendra Hems, and then Kathleen Riley. David? Starting time. Good afternoon, members of the New York City Council. Uh, my name is David Estrada. I'm testifying today on behalf of the New York City Bid Association. I'm also executive director of the Sunset Park Brooklyn Fifth Avenue Bid. Uh, thank you, Chair Joe and I, for holding this hearing. 
Uh, the bid association represents uh, uh, some 76 individual bids throughout the city and we serve as stewards of our diverse commercial corridors and neighborhood public spaces. Uh, our mission has always been to support the almost 100,000 local businesses we serve, to keep our neighborhoods clean and safe and to bring prosperity to our communities. Uh, our, our work has never been more vital than during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, the Bid Association has long called for reductions in overly punitive city measures that hurt small business, and that was long before the pandemic hit. However, this last summer, as the pandemic raged, we released a nine point plan to save the small businesses that are the backbone of our neighborhoods and city. Uh, that plan will be attached to our testimony. And one key point of it includes the review of outdated and overly burdensome city rules and laws. So we're very, very glad to see uh, the two bills being considered today, 2233 and 2234, uh, which will make some strides in reducing fine severity uh, lengthening cure periods, and hopefully putting our city on a path toward a less punitive small business policy. Um, you know, if the success of mm, open uh, restaurants and open streets and open storefronts programs have taught us anything, it's that the city can act quickly to allow small business to operate without unnecessary bureaucracy. You know, simple forms to fill out, uh, mostly easy to understand rules and, and warnings before fines are issued uh, should be all within the new formula for the city's small business policy moving forward. And we should continue to move away from the city's countless arcane and punitive measures, some of which are being addressed by these bills today. Uh, the New York City Bid Association strongly supports any effort to lessen the administrative burdens and operational costs on small businesses, especially now when so many are just barely, barely surviving through tremendous struggle. Uh, we hope that these bills will provide a modicum of relief to the small businesses that have made it this far in the face of staggering odds, uh, and also that it will provide some motivation to the next generation of entrepreneurs who will hopefully open up new storefront businesses and call New York City home. Our city's future depends on it. And the New York City Bid Association looks forward to being an active partner with the city council and the administration on these bills and hopefully others uh, and all the other efforts to help our small businesses and the city's economic recovery. I wanna thank you for the opportunity to testify and I look forward to, uh, to more work. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, we've got a lot of work ahead. I'm looking forward to really rolling up our sleeves as we uh, take the challenges on together. Thank you for what you're doing. My pleasure. Thank you, David. Next, we'll hear from Kendra Hems, followed by Kathleen Riley, and then Susan Grant. Kendra? Sorry, uh, time. Good afternoon. In, uh, in light of spring training and uh, in honor of opening day being around the corner, I am uh, my name is Zach Miller, and I'll be pinch hitting for Kendra Hems, who is the president of the Trucking Association of New York. I would like to thank uh, Chairman Jonah, as, as well as the members of the committee for the opportunity to testify. And I uh, certainly would like to begin by uh, commending the bill sponsors, as well as the council for proposing two pieces of legislation that will provide much needed relief to small business community. Uh, the vast majority of trucking companies are in fact small businesses. Many of our member fleets consist of less than 10 trucks and are family owned and operated. As the council examines a, a variety of regulations to temporarily reduce or suspend fines, we ask you to consider the addition of one regulation that is germane to the trucking industry, specifically the reconciliation of New York City Department of Transportation marking laws with that of the uh, Federal Department of Transportation. We would like to thank council member Gibson for mentioning this uh, earlier in today's hearing. Under current federal and state law, commercial trucks must be marked on both sides of the vehicle with the legal business name or DBA as it appears on the US DOT registrations. The lettering must be written in a color that contrasts with the background color of the vehicle and it must be visible from a minimum distance of 50 feet. However, NYC traffic rule mandates an additional requirement that commercial trucks include their full address in characters at least three inches high on both sides of the vehicle with such display being a, in a color contrasting that of the vehicle and placed approximately midway uh, vertically on doors or side panels. And 
Uh, if that's a mouthful to you, imagine what it is to the trucking companies. Uh, if the vehicle is not marked in this manner, it is deemed an uh, unaltered vehicle and would not be in compliance with NYC laws for purposes of commercial vehicle parking. This subjects the company to the stacking of tickets for not having an altered motor vehicle as well as being in violation if that vehicle is parked in a commercial loading zone. Essentially, how does a truck not become a truck uh, if it's unaltered. Additionally, an exception for this marking requirement exists for vehicles which display widely recognized logo type markings, such as UPS, FedEx, Ryder, and other, other nationally known companies. This truly is a small business specific burden. Many of our members do not operate solely within the confines of New York City and are often not aware of this unique marking requirement until such time they receive a ticket, even though they are otherwise in compliance with both state and federal regulations. Requiring these companies to pull their trucks out of operation uh, to, to add additional markings is a tremendous administrative and financial burden in addition to the uh, tickets and fines that they receive. There is no need for this uh, for the street address to be marked on the vehicle as it is easily accessible by looking up the USDOT number for vehicle re registration information. This additional requirement has no impact on safety, yet results in a significant number of violations and subsequent fines for our members. We respectfully ask that the bill sponsors examine the additional requirement and consider repealing the full address requirement into intro 2233. This measure would go a long Time way to fire. ensuring that our members members are not saddled with significant fines for a regulation that does not comply with federal and state laws. We look forward to working with the council to address our concerns with the current legislation. Thank you. Zach, I want to thank you. Um, and I just want you to know that I put an LS request that addresses this exact issue. Uh, and I had mentioned it at this hearing um, is important because it allows us to bring up other regulations that can be brought in as well. And this is one of the ones that I printed out that could be added to the list of 183. And I hope we'll, I'm hopeful that the list will continue to grow as we really come up with pure real solutions. Thank you so much. No, and, and we really appreciate it. And we appreciate all the, the hard work and uh, dedication that you put into helping our small businesses. I'd like to echo what, what Michael said. Uh, you will be greatly missed uh, in this council. Thank you, Zach. Next, we'll hear from Kathleen Riley, followed by Susan Grant, and then Catherine Welbeck. Kathleen? Starting time. Thank you, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Kathleen Riley with the New York State Restaurant Association. Um, and now, a whole year into the COVID pandemic, our industry has been disproportionately damaged in New York City. The hardships that are experienced by the restaurant industry, specifically, Mandated closure and rigid limitations on business operations have led to losses in jobs, income, and entire businesses. Even today, indoor dining has only been back for a little over two weeks, and we're still operating at a mere 35% capacity, which is compared to 50% in the rest of the state, and beholden to a curfew. Costs incurred by restaurant operators have been immense, and in many cases, operators are finding themselves in debt, unable to pay rent, unable to retain or rehire the staff they had pre-pandemic, and really struggling to see the light at the end of the tunnel. In a recent survey we conducted in early February in partnership with the National Restaurant Association, we found the following. 92% of New York operators had lower sales in January 2021 compared to January 2020. 46% expected their sales to be lower in February and March 2021 compared to January 2021. 83% of operators expect their staffing levels to be lower in February and March than they were in January, all of 2021. New York operators are struggling to be optimistic. 32% think it will take seven to 12 months before their business returns to typical levels. An additional 29% think it will take more than a year. An additional 10% doubt it will ever happen. These next few months will be critical to seeing the surviving restaurants through. And in this precarious atmosphere, we're so grateful to city council specifically council members Gibson, Jonai, and the other sponsors for bringing forward intros 20, 2233 and 224. We're here today to express our wholehearted support for this legislation. The pair of intros would waive or reduce fines on businesses, in some case refund fines paid during the course of COVID and increase the ability for businesses to correct violations without penalty by expanding cure periods. These changes would be welcome relief for the struggling restaurant industry. We applaud an enforcement strategy that's focused more on education and less on extracting fines from small businesses. We find that education-focused enforcement to still be very effective at correcting mistakes 
and it fosters a much more collaborative relationship between enforcement agencies and the business community. At the end of the day, restaurants are working incredibly hard to meet vast and frequently changing regulations from both the city and the state. And we welcome the recognition by city council that businesses are doing their best and eager to fix any errors that come to their attention. Moreover, any dollar that can be kept in the pocket of a restaurant operator could truly be the difference between staying open and rehiring workers or closing for good. The New York State Restaurant Association is so appreciative to city council and to this committee for turning some necessary attention towards the enforcement strategies for the small business community. A shift towards education focused enforcement and away from the extractive fine model is the kind of common sense change that can really make a difference. We fully support these two intros and thank you so much for your time today. Thank you, Kathleen. And again, I invite you to roll up your sleeves so we can move some of the other regulations. Right, so many wrongs. Thank you. Thank you, Kathleen. Next, we'll hear from Susan Grant, followed by Catherine Welbeck. Susan? Starting time. Good afternoon and thank you. My name is Susan Grant and I'm Director of Consumer Protection and Privacy at Consumer Federation of America, which is an association of consumer organizations and state and local consumer protection agencies across the US, including the department, uh, New York City Department of Consumer and Worker Protection. You have my written testimony, so I'm going to depart from that and address some of the really good points that have been made so far in this hearing. Owning your own business is a great way to do what you love and provide for your family, but with it also comes the responsibility to comply with the laws that apply with you, uh, to you. Um, not all uh, violations of consumer laws are intentional. Um, sometimes business owners simply don't know what they're doing, but other times they're irresponsible or even incompetent and uh, their actions can still have very serious uh, impacts on consumers. For instance, if you uh, open up a small used car lot and you offer financing and you don't give consumers the disclosures that are required, explaining um, how much they're gonna be paying and under what terms, that can have a really serious detrimental effect on consumers. Or if you're a home improvement contractor and you're incompetent or you overbook yourself and can't do the job, again, that can have a really serious impact on people. Not all uh, violations merit uh, a cure or a waiver of a penalty. So I think it's really important for the council to work with the New York City Department of Consumer and Worker Protection to figure out where a cure um, it is uh, appropriate, where it's not, uh, what's an appropriate penalty. Uh, perhaps some penalties should be raised and others should be uh, lowered. But I'm really encouraged so far by what I've heard in the back and forth, that you are willing to work with the department. Um, certainly the last thing in the world that you wanna do is impose a new regime that is gonna cost the department a lot of time and money that it doesn't have to totally retool. The other thing I heard that's encouraging is that you want more outreach by the department to business owners to make sure that they know what they should be doing. And to the extent that the city council can provide for more funding to help the department do that, I'm sure that they would appreciate it. So uh, once again, I really appreciate your interest in this and I hope that you can find a, a solution here that works for small businesses as well as uh, for the department, which is mandated to protect your constituents. Thank you. Susan, I just wanna thank you. And I truly believe that we can achieve this while protecting consumers and worker rights. Uh, and that's the balance. So I'm grateful. We have 6,000 rules and regulations to look at. And I'm sure that we can find uh, those that don't have to be uh, definitive with a penalty or fine. So thank you, Susan. Thank you. And I just would like to say that it's not necessarily the number of um, regulations or the amount of the fines that um, is important. I mean, clearly we've had a lot of inflation since um, uh, uh, several years ago, as some of the um, uh, panelists have alluded to the, the, the difference in the amount of fines um, 
between then and now we've got a lot more businesses. There are a lot of factors that have gone into um, the increase in um, rules and laws to protect consumers as well as the amount of fines. So we wouldn't just look at um, numbers. I think you really need to dig deeper to understand um, what is actually necessary to protect your constituents and deter um, uh, bad practices and also to ensure that businesses that want to play by the rules know what the rules are. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Susan. Finally, we'll hear from Catherine Welbeck. Catherine? Starting time. Wonderful. Um, good afternoon, Chairman Joe and I, uh, members of the committee. My name is Kat Welbeck. I'm Civil Rights Counsel at the Student Bar Protection Center, a nonprofit organization focused on alleviating the burden of student debt. And I just want to start by um, thanking the committee for the opportunity to speak today. But also, um, I just want to thank you, Chairman Joe and I. I appreciate your opening remarks, um, reiterating your support for consumer protection. Um, and I would like to echo um, Commissioner Salas, Salas's remarks um, to the importance of consumer, consumer protection enforcement um, across the city and just understanding that although this legislation is specifically intended to provide much needed economic um, stimulus to local um, businesses in the community, uh, my concern lies with the breadth of regulatory rollbacks and how that can hamper agencies like the Department of Consumer and Worker Protection from effectively enforcing um, the laws against companies that do prey on consumers. Um, and just strong consumer protections are essential to robust economic recovery, keeping dollars in the hands of consumers and out of the reach of predatory companies that are seeking to enrich themselves at the expense of consumers. And so without meaningful consequences, those companies can and will operate with impunity. So rigorous consumer protection enforcement and civil penalties send a message and a necessary message um, to predatory companies that they will be held accountable for any kind of illegal acts and practices. And so what I want to do is just provide an example um, and how this operates, for example, in the student debt crisis. Um, so in New York City, more than one in six, approximately one million adults have a student loan collectively amounting to nearly $35 billion. And so this burden ripples across um, borrows financial lives. So affecting their ability to buy homes, start families, start businesses and save for retirement. And um, this burden is especially amplified for the most financially distressed um, borrowers, um, especially with the consequences that are associated with um, student loan delinquency and default. And so what we see is that this crisis affects our local communities. Um, and research has shown that, you know, it stymies um, professional development, professional mobility, small business formation. Um, and again, also what we see is that borrowers aren't bearing this burden equally. So we see is that the fallout of this crisis, many of the delinquencies of faults are um, really impacting black and Latino borrowers. And so, but this crisis is more than just ballooning balances and monthly bills, but it's also a consumer protection crisis where we're seeing predatory companies build entire business models by targeting black and Latino communities of also the bottom line. So we see private student loan companies routinely target communities with high cost, high risk credit products that lead borrowers to struggle. Uh, we see student loan company um, and debt collectors single out communities of color specifically with illegal and predatory tactics and amplifying racial disparities in the student loan system. And as we saw in DCWP's case against Berkeley, uh, Berkeley College, for-profit schools routinely engage in reverse redlining practices that exploit communities of color and drive- Time expired. And, um, and leave borrowers in distress. And so really pointing out these illegal practices and the predatory companies that perpetuate them, impose billions of dollars in needless student debt, interest, and fees on borrowers. And so that's why any meaningful solution to end the student debt crisis also requires action at every level of government, including the cities that bear witness to this every day. And so just really want to point out that consumer protection has to be an essential component of um, COVID-19 recovery efforts, and consumer protection is critical to economic growth. And so um, with that, I know I'm close to time, but I think we saw after the last economic crisis, um, recovery efforts, a lot of them had um, unfortunate ill-intended effects of further entrenching economic inequality. And so as you're going down the road and thinking about pandemic recovery, just really prioritizing um, a relief effort in legislation that centers communities that are um, also often forced to the margins and understanding the role of um, consumer protection in that. And so a reduction of enforcement mechanisms really can further injury to struggling borrowers. And so what we see is that the student loan market is not 
a market that needs less regulation and enforcement, but rather more capacity to employ all the tools um, to protect consumers in the wake of the pandemic, especially to point when many families are struggling with dual crises, both a public health crisis and an economic crisis in many of the same communities that were disproportionately impacted by um, the COVID-19 are also disproportionately impacted by the student debt crisis. And so really we just want New York to continue to take this critical step of ensuring that consumer protection is a part of this pandemic recovery. And thank you so much for your time. Catherine, thank you. Great points. And I promise you that we are going to continue to enforce the consumer protection laws. That's not the intent here. No one that has violated those laws uh, is going to be receiving a refund. We have plenty of other laws that we can look at. But I'm grateful to you for your testimony. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. If we've inadvertently missed anyone who is registered to testify today and is yet to be called, please use the Zoom hand raise function and you will be called in the order that your hand has been raised. Seeing no hands raised, I will now turn it over to Chair Jonai to offer closing remarks. Thank you. I want to thank all of you that took the time to participate today, to be a part of these incredible hearings. Keep in mind, these are historic bills that can truly shape the way New York City government interacts with small businesses. And all of your testimonies are going to be looked at and highlight all of the areas that we can revise our regulations. I'm grateful to you and I'm truly a believer that this is the beginning to a great future, provided that we have the commitment and the wherewithal to continue to look at this and uh, do a deep dive that is necessary. So thank you again. This will conclude today's hearing. God bless you.